Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Council's July 13th session. We will begin with a proclamation recognizing National Parks and Recreation Month by Councilmember Friedson, Council Vice President Albert Knows, and the County Executive. Councilmember Friedson, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to the County Executive, Council Vice President Albert Knows. We're being joined by some of our great leaders in the county uh, from the Department of Recreation, Ms. Anderson. We have uh, uh, from the Parks Department, Director Riley, uh, and we have uh, Ms. Wells Harley from the Parks Foundation, which is a great uh, partner and helps make our park system uh, what it is really central to, to what we're able to do uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, we'll hear from everybody in a minute. I am just really excited to do this. It's one of the most fun proclamations that uh, we get to do. So proud to be able to serve with uh, our colleague, Gabe Albernaz, who uh, was the, the able leader of the recreation department, uh, but particularly this year, I think we have seen the value of these two entities for county residents. These are uh, parks department and a recreation department that really reimagine and re-envision what they were and what they could be. Uh, we saw residents who realized just how much uh, they relied on our 424 parks and our 37,000 acres of parkland. Uh, we frankly saw recreation centers and other recreational facilities that were transformed into life-saving uh, buildings, uh, not just uh, life-improving uh, building and life-nurturing uh, buildings like they are uh, every day, but uh, truly life-saving uh, enterprises. I uh, stood side-by-side, uh, arm-by-arm uh, with many members of the recreation uh, department uh, who changed their job description overnight and uh, were part of food distribution sites and hubs and all kinds of other uh, uh, entities uh, to, to uh, address the uh, crisis that they were in. I think it really speaks to the volume of the, the workforce that we have, the, the talent that we have, the type of leadership uh, that we have uh, in these departments, uh, and the amount of dedication to the community, which is uh, really unrivaled and unmatched. And, and we saw a uh, a, a community that really got to appreciate uh, even more than they normally do, uh, both the uh, public employees uh, and also these public resources uh, that we have in the county. I'm so proud and, and privileged to serve as the parks lead. I am so uh, pleased to be able to serve with uh, Council Vice President Albernaz, who has so much of a background uh, in so many of the programs that we do. Uh, during the day, in the evenings, after school, uh, et cetera. And so I'd love to uh, turn it over to, to him to uh, say a few remarks and then follow that with uh, the county executive uh, as well. Council, uh, Vice President Albernaz. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson, for pulling this proclamation together and for your leadership as lead on parks. You have really hit the ground running and have been a tremendous advocate and a tremendous bridge uh, between so many different communities. So thank you for your continued leadership. And as you stated, for 12 years, I had the honor and privilege of leading what I think is the best recreation department in the United States of America. And I don't just say that uh, because it's close to my heart. I say that as somebody who knows the dedication and the commitment of the staff and the volunteers, seven days a week, 365 um, uh, days out of the year. Um, what, what the Recreation Department staff does is truly extraordinary, and our park staff as well. As you noted, Councilmember Friedson, this last year and a half has been extraordinary, and the value of the types of programs and services and facilities that we have within the parks and recreation space was never more important than it was this last year and a half. Facilities were converted to vaccination sites, homeless shelters, and they served as a true lifeline for so many of our county residents. Recreation and parks as an industry is an extraordinarily noble profession that provides health and wellness, that contributes to our economy, and that really helps contribute to the vibrancy of communities in so many ways, both big and small. And so it's important to recognize this month every year and the incredible work and professionalism of our tremendous staff here in Montgomery County but also the assets that we have before us. Consistently every year when there is a county resident survey, parks and recreation, both programs, services, and amenities is always among the top five in what county residents select as the reason why they both selected to move to Montgomery County, but also choose to stay here. 
So I want to thank Tracy. I want to thank Mike. I want to thank um, Mary Wells Harley and all of your respective teams, and especially my colleague and friend Robin Riley, who so uh, ably uh, leads our recreation department. And I will just thank you again one 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 last time. Uh, there there will never be enough thank yous, especially for this last year and a half. With that, I yield back to you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you so much for your leadership, and now the county executive, please. I think you're you're muted. Unmuted better. So I was saying thank you, Andrew, for putting this together, and and thank you, Gabe, for leaving me a department that truly is one of the best. Um, they played such a pivotal role um, during the pandemic because you know. A lot of places just shut up and went home and we actually pivoted the workforce there to be a workforce for whatever else we needed in this county. And there is just this enormous willingness to continue to serve. And it says a lot about the dedication that people have to serving that, you know, this is it's a part essential part of being in the rec recreation department anyway. And this extended beyond being rec workers, it extended on to being county employees who worked really hard for all the residents of the county. And, you know, I know as, you know, we go through the <clears throat> unwinding from COVID at its worst, that we see in the communities this real thirst for rest restoration of recreation programs. You know, you know what people missed, you know, what they, they want these things back. You know, I wish we'd had a, an accurate crystal ball earlier and been able to know exactly when COVID was going to reach the point when things were more manageable because we could have done some different planning. But, you know, we you know, we deal with the realities where, that were handed at the time. But I'm really glad to see things opening up again, glad to see people being able to partake of things that mean a lot to them. Uh, you hear it from the kids and you hear it from the parents. Um, this, is, this is a big deal. So the work people do and the services that they provide in our communities are really essential, the quality of life. Um, and we've got such beautiful parks, um, even if you're not using it for active recreation, just nice spaces to go and just walk around in and take advantage of, you know, that which is beautiful here. And it's a lot of stuff we offer and a lot of stuff that we've been able to keep going. And I'm glad that uh, people are hitting the ground running and bringing it all back to life again. So thank you for having me join you on this. Um, I don't have a copy of it. Um, somehow it got detached from whatever I was going to read. So just so you know, I'm, I'm not sitting here with a copy I'm looking at. Okay, we'll see if we can get you a copy. And if not, we'll, we'll read it on your behalf uh, you. and, and, and take your, your portion. But appreciate you joining us today. It shows your commitment uh, to, to both of these departments. And now uh, let's hear from the people doing doing the work. Why don't we start with Director Riley, please? Uh, good morning, uh, County Council and uh, County Executive. Thank you so much for your recognition of July in, uh, as Park and Recs Month. It is an extremely rewarding period to be in the park and recreation business. Uh, the recognition of the value of the services we provide seems to be at an all-time high, whether it's uh, people uh, benefiting their physical fitness, their mental health, their social engagement, community building. Those are the types of words we're seeing in the, the feedback we get. And we're so thrilled we've been able to provide uh, programs like the Open Parkways, the Picnic in the Park, uh, great projects like the Henson Museum, the Maydale Nature Center, better athletic fields at our parks and schools. And I'm really proud of my team for being able to continue to deliver uh, during the pandemic when particular people so uh, sorely needed those parks and open spaces and uh, trails. Um, it's very affirming that I can't really spend more than a minute scrolling through my social media feed without seeing pictures of people enjoying our parks, whether it's kids out playing sports on the field, people walking or biking on the trails or the parkways, or people participating in our, our uh, activation programs. It's, it's, it's really uh, kind of smacks you in the face that uh, people are out there enjoying the parks and the programs. I, I need to thank uh, the council so much for your support of the parks every year at the last minute. You shake the couch cushions and you provide the resources that I need and that Casey Anderson needs to 
uh, move the parks forward instead of uh, uh, reduced productions and services. So I need to thank you for that. And I need to thank my great team from uh, deputy directors, John Nissel and Mitty Figueredo on down. I have a great team of very self-motivated uh, staff who uh, deliver these great uh, facilities and services. So again, thank you for supporting uh, the planning board and Casey and I so that we can deliver these programs. And thank you for your recognition of uh, Park and Rec Month. Thank you so much. I'm one of those county residents who leaned on the trails and the park system more than ever during the pandemic and not sure I would have survived it without it. So thank you to your team. And uh, the original public-private partnership, I think in Montgomery County was uh, the uh, Park and Planning Commission and our park system uh, with uh, local leaders and organizations. The Parks Foundation is such a critical part of delivering what we do. It's not the council and the county and the state alone. It's really our volunteers and our Parks Foundation. Ms. Wells-Harley, would you like to add anything? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just sure, I wasn't sure you could hear me. We had a little morning. problem with our internet last night, so I was concerned about that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity to um, be a part of this receiving this proclamation. Uh, as many of you may know or may not know, I've spent my entire working career in the field of parks and recreation. And I have never been more proud than I was this year to see how my colleagues, my friends, my people that I knew in my working years, as well as those while I was on the planning board, to see how they responded to this. It is absolutely incredible. Having worked in the field for such a long time, which I will not mention the years, how many years that's been, I don't think I want to discuss that, but I know the kind of dedication that they showed the kind of hard work, how difficult it is to kind of uh, turn the ship around midway to make it more responsive to what the needs are. And I applaud them. I am so honored to be a part of it. And I'm definitely a, a proud member of the uh, foundation. I think we work very well together and I thank all of you for your support. Thank you for your volunteer leadership, all you've done and, and continue to do as Vice President of the Foundation Board. Uh, we'll turn it over to Tracy Anderson with the Recreation Department. And uh, we, we, we miss Robin Riley uh, here today, but are so pleased to have you and so grateful for uh, how you have led the department through such a challenging year. Please. We're, we're having trouble hearing you. We still can't hear you. I think there's some audio challenges that we're having. Why don't we see if we can sort that out? We will go ahead and read the, the proclamation. Um, County Executive, do you, do you have it yet? Or uh, do you want uh, Council Vice President Albernaz and I to go ahead and do it? I now have a copy of it. Okay, great. Fantastic. We will begin, whereas July 2021 marks the anniversary of National Parks and Recreation Month a time to appreciate the Montgomery County Recreation Department and Montgomery Parks for improving the well-being of our community in physical, mental, and environmental spaces and providing activities and facilities for all to use and value. And whereas Montgomery Parks consists of 424 parks across over 37,000 acres that provide natural space, fields, picnic areas, historic structures, campsites, and activity buildings for residents to enjoy while also maintaining a dedication to promote community through shared spaces and treasured experiences. And? Whereas the Montgomery County Recreation Department provides facilities and services that have elevated the quality of life for community members spanning all ages, cultural backgrounds, and experiences. And? Whereas 
Montgomery Parks and the Montgomery County Recreation have played exceptional roles in the community over the past year, creating safe spaces for residents to maintain social distancing while supplying mental and physical relief and serving in the community through use of facilities and services to aid those in need during the pandemic. Now, therefore, do we, Mark Elrich as County Executive, Gabe Albernaz as Council Vice President, and Andrew Friedson as Council Member of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim July as National Parks and Recreation Month in Montgomery County. And we encourage residents to join us in celebrating the staff, volunteers, and community members who dedicate their time to our parks and recreation with the vision to make a supportive and convivial Montgomery County. Signed on uh, this uh, day in July, 2021 by County Executive Elrich, Council Vice President Albernaz and myself. Unless Ms. Anderson wants to add a few remarks if we have the audio fixed. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Please send our appreciation to the entire team and we'll turn it back to you, Council President. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks so much, uh, Council Member Friedson and County Zach and everyone, uh, Council Vice President. Um, next, we have a proclamation celebrating NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland's 40th anniversary. Um, NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland, uh, has been on the front lines fighting for reproductive freedom for 40 years. Uh, that's a very long time. Uh, we were fortunate to have them in our corner, obviously, during the Trump administration, as they fought back tirelessly uh, when there were attempts to roll back reproductive protections. The Trump administration is now behind us, but the Trump courts will be with us for a very long time. So it's critical that they continue their important work today, closing gaps in protections and coverage wherever they may be across the state, working to defeat anti-choice legislation as well. Every General Assembly session, they are advocating to protect and strengthen reproductive rights on the state level. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that they've been extremely effective. So I was glad to join Council Members Reamer and Jawando recently to present them with a proclamation from the Council at their recent 40th anniversary celebration in Silver Spring. And it's equally important to celebrate them publicly today. So I want to congratulate NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland on their 40th anniversary for all they've done for women and reproductive freedoms. That's a long time to be contributing so much to our, our community. And given the status of our and, uh, political environment right now, there's a lot more work to be done. All of us are continued are committed to continuing our great partnership with them. Um, in particular, I want to thank all their volunteers, their staff, their fantastic board of directors, and especially Executive Director Diana Phillip, for her continued leadership and for being here today. It's truly an honor to be with all of you to celebrate this great, this 40th anniversary that's quite an accomplishment. Let me turn it over to Council Member Novato. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I am very uh, excited to join you on this proclamation. Of course, as the only woman currently uh, serving on this council, I really do wanna use this as an opportunity to highlight the importance of encouraging young women to get active in issues at all levels of government, no matter how seemingly trivial it is really important. I also want to stress that we live in a world now where hard won gains in our reproductive freedoms in this country could be curtailed nationally and women cannot afford to stay silent. Organizations like NARA Pro-Choice Maryland have long acted as conduit for young women to organize and really learn about what modern advocacy entails all while promoting a woman's rights to choose. Leaders have been and continue to be shaped by this fight. And as I approach the end of my time as a council member, I feel a sense of pride when I see how many young women and women of all ages, in particular BIPOC women, are working with organizations like Mayor All Pro-Choice Maryland to hone their leadership skills. I want to end by thanking Mayor All Pro-Choice Maryland for their hard work and dedication in the fight to protect women's reproductive rights. You all have been great voice for this important issue, a great training ground for future leaders. And I personally cannot wait to see what's next in these uh, 40 years ahead, at least, uh, what that will bring for your organization. As a mother of two young adult, young women, uh, this is really, really critically important uh, for all of us. And we must always uh, stand tall and fight for our reproductive rights. And I also want to thank all the men that continually join us in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Okay. Well, so uh, without further, oh, uh, Councilmember Friedson and then uh, Ms. Phillip. 
Councilman Fritz. Yeah, just quickly want to uh, join, say thank you for everything that you've done, 40 years of empowerment. Choice is not only freedom, it's power. Uh, power over your, your body, power over your choices, power over your uh, ability to realize your uh, full potential. And I really do appreciate uh, you and your team and NARAL uh, more broadly for the evidence-based approach to these important uh, issues and this important uh, work. Too often evidence is not part of the conversation on these issues because they tend to be very uh, emotional uh, issues and very uh, deeply embedded issues on all sides. And so uh, your ability to create those connections and uh, put forward uh, data and evidence uh, to demonstrate the impact and the importance of these issues is just absolutely essential. Uh, and it really does uh, not only bring a voice to uh, protect uh, women's rights uh, and, and uh, uh, reproductive freedom, uh, but also ensures that everybody understands the full breadth uh, and magnitude of these issues, which expand far beyond what uh, some often think they do. So thank you for 40 years of advocacy, of empowerment, uh, and of securing uh, freedom for, for women in Maryland and beyond. Thank you so much. Uh, Diana? Thank you, Montgomery County Council, for this proclamation. We really appreciate it. Montgomery County was the home when we started 40 years ago. And so it's really um, wonderful to have this partnership with you. We're very grateful that we've had the opportunity in the last few years to build more capacity to do more local work. So we look forward to approaching your council about other things that we can do in your local communities to meet people where they really are in their lives. And I really um, appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Navarro's and um, uh, remarks and acknowledgement about how important it is for young people to be a part of this movement. We've had over 120 interns now in the last few years that have learned about the policy and political arm of this important movement. And we're with great pride that we launched the mountains of the world to be leaders in our movement. And to the to the men that are here uh, who have all, I believe, benefited at one point in their lives, reproductive freedom and reproductive rights. And so this is uh, reproductive rights and our reproductive freedom is key to economic security and liberty. And this is something that people do not think enough about, unfortunately, and the reason why we stay vigilant and determined to protect and advance anything that we possibly can regarding pregnancy and all its complexity and the fact that we honor pregnancy in all its complexity, the right to form our families if, when, and how we choose, and to parent in dignity, in good health, and in safety. So thank you. Thank you for the acknowledgement. We appreciate it. The encouragement, everything. It's what we need to hear every day. But sometimes this is a tough gig, and it's really very difficult every day to look at the news and see the types of um, – restrictions that are being passed across the nation. And I can't emphasize enough how important Maryland is and how we have people from the eastern part of the United States and across the globe that come to Maryland and get those services that they need through abortion care, especially later abortion care. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Terrific. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, okay, uh, we will uh, can read the proclamation. Um, Council Member Navarro, you'll follow me, right? And then Council Member Preetson. So this is a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council, whereas NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland launched in Silver Spring in 1981 is the only statewide organization dedicated to protecting and promoting the reproductive freedom of all people living in Maryland. And Whereas over the past 40 years, NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland mm -hmm. has engaged in countless activities to build and sustain a strong and vibrant reproductive rights community, which is essential to liberty and economic security. Whereas Maryland is fortunate to have NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland engaged in statewide outreach, policy research, and coalition building to identify issues that affect reproductive freedom and create issue-specific campaigns to raise public awareness and organize allies to act. And Whereas the members of NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland are dedicated to advancing reproductive health, rights, and justice and passing pro-choice measures or defeating anti-choice bills and ensuring lawmakers hear from their constituents regarding issues affecting reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy and. Whereas now Pro-Choice Maryland is celebrating its 40th anniversary this month 
and will continue its mission to develop and sustain a constituency that uses the political process to guarantee everyone the right to make personal decisions regarding the full range of reproductive choices, including preventing unintended pregnancy, bearing healthy children, and accessing safe abortion care. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby congratulates NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland, and be it further resolved that the County Council officially congratulates NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland on 40 years of protecting the right to choose. Presented on the 13th day of July, the year 2021, signed by Councilmember Nevado and myself. Thank you so much for all your great work. Thank look you. look forward to the next 40 years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you colleagues. Next is a proclamation honoring Monica Escalante's 20 years of service to Montgomery Hospice by Council Member Nevado. Thank you, Council President. I also would like to uh, make sure that my colleague Abila Bernals is joining us and um, want to mention that I believe we have with us as well, uh, Ms. Uh, Dana Pauly, CEO of Leadership Montgomery, uh, Maria Gomez, CEO of Mary Center, Sonia Mora from our Latino Health Initiative, Ana Maria Izquierdo Porrera, the Executive Director of Care for Your Health, Dr. Raul Barrientos, who is a uh, community activist, Helena Surcida from Latino Health Initiative, Suyana Quinales Parker from La Clinica del Pueblo. We have also, I believe, Mr. Diego Riburu from Identity, Grace Rivera Oven, who of course has led the Germantown uh, County Hub very nicely. And um, some folks that we also uh, invited and hopefully are here, Paola Fernandez Segarra and David El Pozo. And I wanna start um, by just making a few remarks about this extraordinary person. So Monica, I want to congratulate you on your 20 years of service and leadership with Montgomery hospice and wish you the best of luck in the next phase of your career. I am in awe of everything you have accomplished, including establishing the Center for Learning, which has offered courses that have helped provide holistic, culturally competent end-of-life care where it's most needed. In addition, your many years as a member of the Latino Health Initiative, advocating for health parity in the Latino, Black, and Asian communities have made a strong positive impact in our county. You were instrumental in the advocacy, conception, and implementation of the Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, the Latino COVID-19 initiative. Your sharp, calm, positive, and effective demeanor has yielded so many positive results for our entire county in so many years. I consider you not just a partner and a valuable asset in the effort to forge a more equitable and just system but also a dear friend and fixture in the greater Washington community. We have been extremely fortunate that you decided to bring your talents our way. And from the bottom of my heart, I cannot thank you enough for everything you've given to our residents. On a personal note, I will always cherish the caring and special way in which you supported me when we met as leadership Montgomery classmates in 2009. Very few people knew that my younger sister was dying of breast cancer and then my mom died suddenly right after my election victory was certified. You were right there, giving me sage advice about grief and gratitude. And I have carried that with me ever since. You have a very special light, and I feel honored to have been in your presence. With that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Albornoz, who I know also has a very uh, amazing relationship with you, and it's a great uh, admirer as well. Well, thank you, Councilmember Navarro, and thank you for your continued leadership, uh, including initiating this really important proclamation. I hadn't heard that story until you just shared it uh, with Monica. Not surprised uh, that Monica would be there for you during those difficult that difficult year, um, but just it's a testament to her dedication, her professionalism, and her friendship. Um, I've gotten to know her through her capacity and her leadership with the Latino Health Initiative, and I'm not surprised also about the remarkable accomplishments in her day job, um, and, and, but she has treated her work with the Latino Health Initiative with just total and complete dedication. 
Uh, she has not just been a leader in our Latino community, but has built tremendous coalitions among all of our minority communities and has served as a bridge and coalition builder during a time when we so desperately needed it. And this last year and a half, I can't think of a stronger and more important leader, uh, as well as the remarkable people that I see around the Zoom call to pull together an initiative that is literally nationally award-winning. And it's because of the strong foundation of the Latino Health Initiative that thousands, and I mean thousands of lives were saved. Thousands of lives were improved. And while the work continues and the struggle has not stopped, uh, I just want to express my deep and utter appreciation and respect for you. And thank you, Monica, for your just incredible leadership, your friendship, and for guiding all of us in so many different ways. So congratulations. This proclamation is extraordinarily well-deserved and extraordinarily well-earned. I yield back to you, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President Albert Nos. Um, and of course, I wish we did have time for everyone to make remarks, but we have this schedule that we have to adhere to. But I wanted to make sure that, uh, Monica, that you would see all the familiar faces of you know, just a small sample of your colleagues, your friends, your admirers uh, accompanying you here today. I'm going to read the proclamation and then I uh, would love to have Monica make some remarks as well. So the proclamation reads, whereas Ms. Monica Escalante has made herself a fixture in the greater Washington community, as a board member of the Hospice Network of Maryland, treasurer of the Board of Leadership Montgomery, steering committee co-chair of the Montgomery County Latino Health Initiative, and through her membership in the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization's Diversity Advisory Council. And whereas Ms. Escalante has since 2001 worked in the end of life care with her tenure at the helm of Montgomery Hospice, making up the majority of her career in the field. And whereas Ms. Escalante's crowning achievement has been the establishment of Montgomery Hospice's Center for Learning, which has for over a decade offered courses that recognize racial, religious, cultural, and ethnic diversity as the basis to understanding and appreciating patients' diversity, which is a critical element for providing quality care. Whereas as a native of Bolivia, Ms. Escalante has leveraged her background as a financial consultant with the Bolivian Ministry of Finance to provide invaluable qualitative and quantitative research on issues such as mental health and substance abuse within the nationwide Latino community on behalf of such organizations as the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Aging. And whereas in 2019, Ms. Escalante was named as a recipient of the 2019 Minority Business Leader Award by the Washington Business Journal in recognition of her numerous positive contributions to the field of end of life care and her years of dedicated service to families in need of support and comfort. Now, therefore, be it resolved, that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes the contributions of Ms. Monica Escalante and presents this proclamation to Ms. Monica Escalante on the 13th day of July in the year 2021. And this is, of course, signed by our County Council, President Hucker and myself. And I am just have to say that I am at least comforted by the notion that you're not going to go too, too far away um, because we, of course, want to continue to stay in touch and to benefit from your extraordinary talent and your dedication to community. So big round of applause. And then uh, now we would love to hear from you, Monica. Thank you very much. I am in tears here listening to these beautiful words. Um, my heart is inflated with joy, pride. Um, I, this is totally unexpected and I'm so humbled so humbled. I will treasure this pro proclamation for the rest of my life. And thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Gabe, for such beautiful words and for thinking of, of me. Um, yes, it's been wonderful to start the Center for Learning and do end-of-life education that is culturally sensitive for all minorities in our county. And hopefully we've changed and moved the needle a little bit in terms of health disparities for the people who are facing the end of their lives. But I have to say, the highlight of my years working in Montgomery County was the last year and a half. And for me to see 
a disparity that we started looking at what is going on here. Our people are dying. And someone like me who's worked 19 years seeing people leave their loved ones suddenly. We saw that and we turned it around. So the work that Salud y Bienestar has done and my humble participation supporting the work of so many others that made it possible, including the county council and our council members, um, is we, what we accomplished here is not a small thing. A despair, a injustice has been made right in a matter of a short time. And now we have one of the highest res rates of vaccinated folks. I mean, this is something that all of us should remember every day. What made a difference? We allow the people who know the community work with the community and we turn it around. The rest of the country really needs to learn from this experience. Um, and I'm humbled to say that, you know, I, I moved, I'm in, in the Eastern Shore now, um, and um, I just confirmed this morning that I'm the first Latina to be the president of a hospice in the nation, in the 40 years of hospices across the nation. So um, I, 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 I will treasure my experience with Montgomery County, and I just don't know what else to say other than it is a wonderful county that I already miss. But what you have accomplished so far is not a small thing. And it's the work and determination of people that love their communities and everybody holding hands together to accomplish this. So thank you very, very much. I will cry the whole rest of the day remembering these beautiful moments. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Gracias, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Um, I just in closing want to say that your remarks just um, emphasizes and puts an exclamation point on the amazing love and dedication of our leaders here in this county, both community leaders, organizational leaders, that as you said, just, you know, in a matter of 48 hours, stood up and said, there's something that we can do here and we have the talent, the expertise, if you trust us, we can do this. And we were ever so fortunate to have a leader like Sonia Mora at the helm of the Latino Health Initiative but immediately, as we approached her, said, of course, I will take the the, the reins here and, and we can see what we can do. Um, so my heart is also really full. And um, and I think it's important, especially for our young people of color, to see that leaders do respond and that there is hope and that when you put your heart to it, you can really make a difference. Um, so we will miss you, Monica. But, uh, of course, you know, I need to get that address of yours in the Eastern Shore so we can all show up once in a while and hang out with you. Maybe do some yoga, because that's the other thing that didn't make it into the proclamation is that it, she's a super yogi. So we all can use some more yoga these days. Thank you. Te quiero mucho. Cuídate. Saludos. Un abrazo a todos. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, now we're on to general business. Um, Madam Clerk, can you please share the announcements, agenda changes, or the petitions? Good morning, Mr. President. There are no announcements, and the council has not received any petitions this morning. Okay, thank you. The uh, clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members for the meetings of April 27th, May 4th, and 10th, 2021. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. Now we will sit as the Board of Health. Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, are we ready for our briefing? Yes, we are here and I would ask that the host allow Dr. Bridges to be admitted. I think he is still in the virtual waiting room. Um, yes, so whoever is making the controls, if you could please admit Dr. Bridges and I'm not that. sure if Dr. Stoddard is, Dr. Stoddard is here. Dr. Bridgers, welcome to. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't have a formal PowerPoint presentation, but we'll go through a couple of important points to hammer home and emphasize. 
obviously starting with our COVID numbers. Uh, the COVID numbers remain low overall. Um, however, there have been some increases across the state and small increases in our local numbers uh, as referenced by our test positivity that is now at 0.8%. Uh, and the number of new cases, there have been multiple days where we have been in the high teens, and uh, this morning it was actually 20. Our hospitalizations have not correlated in terms of increase. We've only had two hospitalizations, excuse me, overnight. Um, and the hospitalization numbers remain low, even in the uh, small increase in those daily cases. Now, looking at the numbers, the state has uh, repeatedly said New cases are major overwhelmingly tied to individuals who are not vaccinated. Deaths, COVID-related deaths, are tied to individuals who are not vaccinated. COVID-related hospitalizations are tied to individuals who are not vaccinated. Uh, and so if you're recognizing a theme here, the overwhelming uh, cause for our continued transmission and the presence of COVID within our communities are in individuals who are not vaccinated. Uh, and we do recognize that for younger children, they are not yet eligible to be vaccinated, but we do have a significant portion of our population, particularly in the 20 to 29 year old group that has low rates of uh, vaccine uptake so far. When we break down the new cases in the last month, and again, I will send you all this, send you all this file um, at the conclusion of my remarks. But when we look at cases over the last month between July 10th, June 10th and July 7th, 18.4 percent of those cases, which is the largest group, is 20 to 29, followed by 17 percent of new cases in 30 to 39 year olds. Next uh, largest group is 12%, which is 40 to 49 year olds, followed by 11.8% in the 10 to 19 category, and 11.4% respectively in the 50 to 59 year old group and the 60 to 69 year old group. 10% of new cases during that time period are in ages zero to nine. Uh, when we break that down by race and ethnicity, looking again overall during that last month period, 25% of new cases are in non-Hispanic Black residents, 20.6% are in non-Hispanic whites, 20.6% is unknown, 17.5% uh, are in Hispanic residents, 3.5% are in non-Hispanic Asian residents, and 12.7% in other in an other category. So I say all that to say that uh, as I'll pivot to vaccines in a minute, where we've got tremendous success in that, we still see reservoirs and pockets of COVID-19 in our community in large part due to uh, the remaining individuals who are not vaccinated. So I want to emphasize and set out another ask and call for any individual who's not vaccinated to encourage them to get vaccinated, to protect themselves and to protect their families and the overall community to drive numbers down. Now, when we break this down, obviously there's lots of attention talking about the Delta variant. Uh, that has uh, become the predominant strain in the United States uh, on a call with the state this morning. Uh, those uh, samples that have been sequenced by the state, approximately 50% remain the alpha variant or the UK variant, the B117. Uh, 40%, which is on the rise, uh, represents the Delta variant or the Indian variant that has received a lot of attention and becoming the predominant strain across the world and across the country. There have been sporadic reports of a Lambda variant, which has been all, is the name for the Peruvian variant uh, that has been, been referenced, but I have not seen any uh, reports of Lambda cases uh, being sequenced for, out of Montgomery County. Uh, so it's important to continue to monitor those trends as well, uh, because obviously we're concerned about the Delta variant being more contagious and potentially causing a more severe COVID picture, again, particularly in those individuals who have not been vaccinated. Now, I would, uh, speaking of vaccines, I want to uh, report our most recent numbers. We continue to lead the country in terms of jurisdictions uh, and counties over 300,000 uh, individuals. Uh, as well as the percentage of residents covered in the state. Uh, when we look at just those individuals who are eligible being 12 and up, we have 89.6% of our population having received at least one dose and 81.4% of our population being fully vaccinated. 
when we look at the population over the age of 65, 98.3% of those individuals have received at least one dose, and 92.6% of those individuals have been fully vaccinated. And when we stretch that out to the total population, 76.1% have received at least one dose, and 69.1% have been fully vaccinated. We continue those efforts uh, working with our community partners to expand vaccines, particularly in those zip codes that continue to have lower rates of uptake. And we again have consolidated the county apparatus into three sites, Dennis Avenue, uh, currently at our 401 Hungerford site that will move to Montgomery College in Rockville and the Up County uh, Regional Service Center. Individual that's open Monday through Sunday, nine to six, individuals can get tested as well as get vaccinated in those spaces. Now, the last thing I'll mention in terms of COVID-related things and move on to questions and, and other general things is there have been a couple of updates recently from CDC and others. The first one is the CDC on Friday did put out updated guidelines related to returning to school in terms of face covering recommendations as well as spacing recommendations and so forth. Uh, we've met with MCPS again throughout the pandemic and throughout the last several weeks to help inform and provide guidance to them in terms of their ultimate policy that they will put forward for schools. Um, I, I know that they're continuing to work on that uh, and the state this morning in the call referenced that now that CDC has put forth that guidelines, those, that set of guidelines, MDH and MSDE will be working on a state version of that to provide to the local school districts. I continue to be a proponent, as referenced by the health, uh, public health recommendations put out several weeks ago, that any individual who is not vaccinated should continue to wear a face covering when around other individuals. Um, particularly those, regardless of the cause, whether you've chosen not to receive the vaccine or if you're not eligible to receive the vaccine. And particularly as it relates to children uh, under the age of 12, that recommendation is consistent with the recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as consistent with the recommendations that the CDC put forward on Friday. The second item that has come up over uh, the last week has been the question of whether or not boosters will be needed for uh, vaccines. Uh, representatives from Pfizer met with the FDA and CDC uh, and representatives from the White House, I believe, on yesterday. Uh, it is, there seems to be some disagreement on that. Uh, at the moment, the federal level continues to support that. At this time, there is no any, in, there's no indication that boosters will be needed uh, for Pfizer or Moderna shots. Um, but as that continues to evolve and we get more information, certainly we will continue to keep you apprised of that. And we have, we continue to contingency plan should we need to, uh, provide boosters to the community in the fall. There have not been any updates or indication of an updated timeline in terms of when the vaccines will become available to children under the age of 12. The third piece is that recently yesterday, uh, the CDC has put out language related to the Johnson Johnson vaccine. There have been a number of cases and individuals who received the Johnson Johnson vaccine who went on to develop Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, it is a small number of cases um, and they are currently investigating that. I don't have any further information at this time, uh, but again, as we find out more information, we will certainly make that available to our residents in a clear, transparent way to help them uh, uh, guide their medical decisions and be on the lookout if any uh, particular symptoms develop. Well, the last thing I would mention, and this is a non-COVID related piece, is to remind people that health continues. <laughs> We've talked about this before. And on a couple of, of things I want to emphasize is particularly for children in the vaccine and immunization space, we need parents to get their kids caught up on any vaccines that they may have missed over the last year due to COVID and not being able to uh, access the healthcare enterprise. We encourage you to take advantage of the summertime to make sure that your child is up to date with their routine standard vaccines as uh, we move back into the school reentry space in the fall. Additionally, we encourage folks who have not had any type of physicals or primary care prevention visits in the last year and a half during COVID to go get your checkups, get your annual physical, check your blood pressures, check your glucose and all those kinds of things uh, to make sure that you're staying in shape and healthy. 
And the last thing is, again, continuing to encourage folks to be safe in your activities this summer in terms of being around other individuals, taking uh, par partaking in summertime, summertime activities such as swimming and those kind of things, and making sure that you're taking the necessary safety precautions to keep you and your family safe. Drink lots of water, stay hydrated, check on your elderly residents um, or those who may be um, have some mobile complications, uh, particularly given the increased temperatures, and make sure that they have adequate provisions to stay cool and stay hydrated uh, to stay safe. I will conclude my remarks there. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Dr. Bridgers, did you have any additions uh, from public health perspective? Good morning, all. Um, yes, Dr. Gales, just a couple of updates. I just wanted to remind all that we continue to provide testing and vaccination spaces. Um, please visit our website, MontgomeryCountyMaryland.gov forward slash COVID-19 forward slash vaccines. Although we um, appointments aren't required, we do encourage folks to make appointment online for accountability so that we can make sure that we have enough vaccines um, on site, we are currently testing and vaccinating at three sites at our Dennis Avenue Health Center in Silver Spring, at our Montgomery College Rockville campus, and at our Up County Regional Service Center. All these spaces and places are located uh, with the addresses uh, on the website. They are accessible via uh, public transportation. And uh, we're testing and vaccinating uh, Monday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, that schedule may vary. We also have our community partners testing and vaccinating as well, and they may have um, a variation of that schedule. Lastly, I'd like to encourage folks, if there are any spaces where you uh, think that we should have a, a vaccine site or host a vaccination pod, please, again, visit the website. There is a link. Click on Suggest a Vaccination Site, and we will visit your space. We know that there are community events that go on throughout the summer, and we would love to come to your community to provide a testing and a vaccination um, space that's available. Finally, if you travel to any spaces throughout um, the United States or abroad and you feel that you've been uh, in close contact or you just aren't sure, I encourage all to get tested. We have those testing spaces available and we'd like to uh, have you visit those spaces and get tested, but more importantly, get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Gales, for allowing me the opportunity to provide that update subject to any question from the council sitting as a board of health. Good morning. I have just a couple additional comments. Uh, as you will know, we've closed down the, the mass vaccination site at the Germantown uh, Montgomery College campus. We did transfer many of those activities over to the Up County Regional Service Center. I did want to report that in the in the period that the site was operating, we we conducted we we performed more than seventy five thousand vaccinations, both combining first and second doses at that site. So obviously it was a huge success in, in the time that it operated and really pushed us um, farther along. I did want to um as one additional comment to what Dr. Gale said, and uh, Dr. Fauci did report earlier this week that 99.2% of the fatalities uh, over the last month from COVID-19 have been in the unvaccinated. And so obviously what we're seeing at the local and state level is also a national trend whereby vaccination um, obviously is uh, a key indicator of who is suffering the most severe consequences of the illness. Uh, we are, I will say, um, watching very closely what's happening in other parts of the world where the Delta variant has more thoroughly taken over. Uh, I think, as we've said in previous uh, briefings, we fully expect the Delta variant, given its um, increased transmissibility, will take over as the dominant strain, both in Montgomery County, the state of Maryland, and everywhere else in the country. Um, and so, obviously, we watch what's happened in other countries, and we look at, you know, take, you know, Israel. I know we've talked about that a little bit, where um, people have uh, illustrated maybe some some reduced effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine, but the, I think it's key to to recognize that the reduced effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine is is only seen really in people uh, trans or being capable of being infected by the disease. The vaccines are still wildly ninety nine and ninety eight percent effective against preventing severe illness, even in the cases where people have gotten infected with the Delta variant who were vaccinated. And so I think that's a key thing to recognize is that. 
Um, even in cases where the Delta is more effective at, at potentially infecting people who have been vaccinated, it has not been proven more effective in making them severely ill to the point that it called, requires hospitalization or uh, costs people their lives in significant numbers. So it is important to recognize that even, you know, the data is still out there on exactly what the reduction in effectiveness is against the Delta variant for any of the vaccines. But even in the cases where there is some degree of reduced effectiveness for preventing transmission, it's not seen in the severe consequences and outcomes. And so that's all I have this morning and happy to take some questions. Uh, thank, thank you all. Uh, Council Member Reamer. <clears throat> thank you. Um, first, just a brief comment on this data point. We're talking a lot about how among recent uh, deaths, you know, that they're almost exclusively among the unvaccinated. Uh, and that is definitely true. It also occurs to me that if you look at the big picture, there's been 607,000 deaths so far, thanks to this pandemic. And all of, you know, almost all of them have been among the unvaccinated because of course, everyone who was dying in the first six months and year of the pandemic was, they were not, you know, six months, they were not vaccinated either. Um, so, you know, it's just that everyone who has died, except for a, handful of cases is my understanding uh, is has been unvaccinated um, and that trend of course is continuing now um, so you know folks need to understand like you're comparing if you're concerned about the impact of the vaccinations you can look at the ledger 607,000 deaths among the unvaccinated uh, a handful among those who have been vaccinated for reasons that are now I understand as well, uh, managed, you know, the J&J &J warning is now managed. And so the prospects of any future serious adverse health, you know, event from that is essentially now not, <clears throat> not a great risk. So, um, uh, you know, the ledger is even more dramatic in some sense than, than we might explain. Um, uh, so I, I do understand from, talking with uh, from input I've received that there's an open question as to whether we can mandate vaccinations for students. So I think we can just keep our eye on that and, you know, hear, hear from you as that proceeds and there's more clarity. Um, you know, I, I do think we ought to require vaccinations if we can. If we can't, then, uh, you know, we'll need another level of government to, to act that. And I, I do recognize and appreciate that general point about get your regular vaccinations. I think people are comfortable with that. And, uh, you know, it's a good, it's a good message for us to be uh, putting out there. So noted and, uh, you know, appreciate that. Um, so that's, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Councilman Rumor, thank you for your question. And, and you did, you did ask about mandating a vaccine. So that level of policy would be set forward by the state board of education and MSDE. Um, and at this time, I don't have any updates in terms of if, you know, they've decided to take that action and we're still waiting to see if they'll, they'll take that, that level of action. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, thank you to all three of you for your continued dedication and, and that of your respective teams. Um, I have noticed sort of a, a trend that's not entirely surprising, but still um, disappointing, uh, which is, and I'm especially in tune to this, as you guys know, and, and all of my colleagues that have children understand, for those that are the, under the age of 12, we're see, I'm seeing fewer and fewer of them wearing masks uh, indoors and at gatherings. Uh, we were in church last weekend, and we were one of the only families. This was not in Montgomery County, uh, but we were one of the only families uh, whose kids were still wearing masks. And so if you could just stress once again, Dr. Gales, uh, the importance of those unvaccinated, but in particular children, and as we're seeing nationally, uh, there has been some disturbing information about some of the variants uh, impacting kids. Uh, if you could stress that again for everyone until the vaccine is available to everyone, but especially children, the importance of wearing masks, uh, particularly for our kids who are unvaccinated. Thank you, Councilmember Albernos, for your, your, your 
comment, but then also thank you for continuing to have your children wear face coverings and protect them and protect community. Uh, you know, I'll be very clear from a public health perspective, it is in the best interest of individuals who are not vaccinated, particularly those who aren't eligible to get vaccinated, to continue to do so to protect themselves and protect their families. When we look at the breakdown in the last month, 22% of our new cases were under the age of 19. And so that includes children who are under the age of 12 who are not eligible for the vaccine and a variable number of, of children who are 12 to 19 who, for whatever reason, have yet to be vaccinated or have chosen not to do so. Uh, and we know that they can get sick. Um, and particularly with the Delta variant, we know that they are at an increased risk of having a more complicated medical uh, a COVID trajectory than potentially with the novel strain that we saw last year. So we want to make sure that folks um, don't develop a false sense of security to say, well, if children get it, they're going to be completely fine. We don't know that for sure, and particularly given the advent of these new variant strains that are more contagious uh, and could potentially cause a more severe form of illness or course of illness. We can't definitively say that. So overall, kids are susceptible uh, because they're not vaccinated and we encourage parents and families and others to take the steps needed uh, to protect them and keep them safe until they're able to get the vaccine. That was perfectly said. And, and I'll just end with a comment, but I, I think all of us watched with horror, including Dr. Fauci, who specifically referenced at a partisan conference this past weekend where people were literally cheering, cheering. Uh, not having hit vaccination goals nationally. You know, that, that we've come to this is just shocking and depressing. Uh, and we just continue to be fortunate that at least here in Montgomery County and through most of the state of Maryland, uh, we have followed the science from the beginning. And we have followed that guidance with really remarkable outcomes uh, when you consider everything that we've had to deal with this last year and a half. So, uh, we all must remain vigilant and leaders in this space. And I want to just once again end by thanking all of you for your continued dedication. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council Vice President. Cal uh, Council Member Blass. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, as we have these every other week uh, discussions, uh, you know, the news continues to, to improve. And the 89.6% of eligible residents who've received one dose and the 81.4% who are fully vaccinated is fantastic. Uh, ju juxtaposing that to the comments that the council vice president just made uh, uh, about sentiments in other parts of the country. And uh, Dr. Gales, I think you had said, and I missed it, but I, I'd like you to reiterate it for, for my own purpose and everyone else's. Our vaccination rates are the highest among large counties, or, or can you repeat that? Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, Councilmember Glass, for the question. So uh, as best as we can tell over the last several weeks, for counties uh, over the, over 300,000 in population, we have been uh, had the highest percentage of our residents vaccinated in terms of eligible population. That is so across the country, not just in the state. Uh, and, and that is a true testament to, to the work you, your teams, all the doctors here, uh, and uh, everybody else in county government and state government who are, are helping in those efforts. And again, going back to the, the some of the national sentiment that we've been hearing lately, troubling national sentiment, you know, when, when President Biden was saying that we need communities uh, and local governments to go door to door knocking on, on neighbors' doors, encouraging them to get vaccinated and offer the direct assistance for them. That is work that we've undertaken months ago uh, that, that we all recognized was so important because we saw the racial gaps that were existing uh, and knew that we had to extend more of our support into those underserved communities. And so I would, uh, I would suggest that we offer our, our knowledge and expertise for the, the facts that you just outlined as, as the county, uh, one of the largest counties, if not the largest county with the highest vaccination rates, having been doing this work for months, uh, offer our assistance, your assistance and expertise, all of you, to the, the county executives and the governors and the mayors across the country who are hesitant, uh, who don't quite know how to undertake this work, uh, because we've been doing it, you've been doing it, uh, and we are proving successful in it. And we, we can't give up 
until as many people who want to get vaccinated get that vaccination rate, uh, get those vaccinations. But um, the proof is in the pudding and the hard work that we have been undertaking for months and uh, is, is working. And so uh, a genuine and sincere thank you to all of you and your teams. And I look forward to yet another uh, update in the coming weeks with hopefully uh, even uh, in more increases in those vaccination rates. So, so thank you all for the work that you're doing. Thank you, uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank you to all who are, who are literally saving lives in, in uh, Montgomery County and beyond. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but Dr. Gales, I think you stay on the spot as, as does your team. You always, someone is always looking to you for, for information. Um, and, and thank goodness you always give it, uh, uh, to, to, to save us all. But the other day I was in a grocery store. I seem to spend my life in a grocery store. I was in a grocery store and I was wearing a mask. A person who knew me came over and who was not wearing a mask and said, why are you still wearing a mask? Weren't you, you know, vaccinated? I said, yes, I was. But I, you know, I figured that in a grocery store, if you're going to meet someone, especially, a, you know, a, a person, a child who couldn't get the vaccination, that you might meet them in a grocery store. And I just wanted to be careful. And they said, does Dr. Gales wear a mask in a grocery store? And I said, the next time I see Dr. Gales, I will ask him. So can you give any insight as to what you do and, and what others might do as well? Well, thank you, Councilmember Katz, uh, for your question. And certainly if you find any deals in the grocery stores, let me know. <laughs> I spend a fair amount of time shopping as well, always looking for a good bargain. Uh, I will text you. I will text you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, I, so I actually try to be very strategic in terms of when I go out in public, in the off chance someone may say, that's Dr. Gales, I'm watching what he's doing, that kind of thing. Um, and so I've tried to, you know, to help build confidence in terms of, you know, being fully vaccinated and so forth. I've tried to not wear my mask as much in public to show, you know, to pattern that, you know, I've been vaccinated and I'm moving about. Um, now there, so I've probably more recently, um, haven't worn my mask as frequently in spaces like grocery stores and things like that. However, at the same time, I'm very careful still to keep my distance from others and continue to, you know, uh, limit my interaction, you know, with, with other folks. Uh, and so sometimes I will, you know, particularly if it's a crowded space uh, where I know, you know, with capacity limits relaxed, I'll throw it on just, you know, because I'm, I'm routinized in that. Um, and given, you know, so many people, you know, with the different variants going on, and you're right, there's still folks who aren't able to get the vaccine uh, due to different, whether they're immunocompromised or due to their age. Uh, but I am trying to, you know, instill some confidence potentially in folks to feel more comfortable if they've been fully vaccinated, being able to be in open spaces without it. Now, that said, when I do go work out, particularly if I'm going to be in a smaller confined room, the spin studio or in a smaller studio working out with a lot of people, uh, I will sometimes wear my, continue to wear my face covering in those spaces just due to, um, you know, um, ventilation and those kinds of things. Um, and that, I will say that's not always, you know, if I'm lifting weights and again, it's a light like capacity, I'm more inclined to not wear it just, you know, due to limited exposure to other folks. Uh, and so I use it as an example to say that as people move through and move forward, um, even being fully vaccinated, we recognize that there's different levels of confidence, if you will, uh, in terms of being able to, not necessarily confidence, but comfort. I would say it's probably more comfort than confidence in terms of being in spaces with others. And that's why we continue to support folks. If you say, hey, I know I'm fully vaccinated, but I, you know, I'm still going to wear my face cover because it, you know, it gives me a greater sense of self comfort. Uh, and that's totally fine. And that's uplifted. But we do want to make sure that folks understand again, to go back to a point that was mentioned by Dr. Bridges and Dr. Stoddard is the vaccines are efficacious. They do provide protection. Um, and they are an important step if you've been fully vaccinated and achieved that status. Now, one thing I will mention, though, that is important to note, that wearing face coverings also has other benefits 
and outside of the COVID space. And this is a conversation we'll probably and likely engage in the fall when it comes to flu prevention yeah. and allergy season. Uh, as a person who has seasonal allergies pretty bad at the change of seasons, the face coverings help me tremendously <laughs> when the seasons change this year from an allergy perspective being outdoors. And when we talk about flu season coming up this year, obviously we want people, as many people to get vaccinated as possible with the flu shot. But we saw last year when people were wearing face coverings, we saw a drastic decrease uh, in terms of the number of flu cases. So I want to prime people for that conversation as we move forward in the fall, because I don't. And in fact, here's my face covering here because I'm in a healthcare setting. I'm in our office where we still require it. I don't want people to automatically associate the face covering only with COVID and understand that it also can have other benefits other parts of the year in terms of minimizing disease transmission for other things. So I hope that answers your question. It, it um, does. And not I not 100% slam dunk, but just being real in terms of, of how I think you're thinking. Well, it does. And I also appreciate the fact that people are much more aware that they should wash their hands, that they should do the things that are so that they should have been doing all along, candidly. But but now we're all aware to do that as well. So, again, thank you all for everything that you do. I'm going to turn it back over to Council President. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Gales, I have to share with you, I was at a conference, uh, the first conference uh, that the Gaylord National has had in some time. Uh, thousands of people there, uh, some donning masks, some not. Um, requirements for uh, vaccination. In fact, uh, prior to us being able to do some of the interactions with the vice president who was there, we all had to have COVID testing on site uh, in addition to proof of vaccination. Um, so folks are really encouraging uh, the best practices, I think, to ensure and keep everyone safe. Daily checks every morning in terms of symptoms. Uh, you had to you know, answer a questionnaire similar to what our schools are doing. So we see that in a lot uh, of areas, folks are doing the right thing, and that's encouraging. Um, I will say that while Dr. Kroll, uh, who attended the meeting, he was a panelist at one of the events at the National Association of Counties, uh, and I were talking, a young man came up to us uh, and said he was uh, from Montgomery County, was very proud of what he had heard from Dr. Kroll and the work that he had been doing uh, around health. Uh, and Dr. Cole asked him, he was donning a mask. He said, had, had he been vaccinated? And he said, no, uh, and proceeded to have a conversation with this young man about why it was important and why he needed to do this. This was a young black man, uh, right in the uh, place where we know we're seeing the most risk and the most adverse effects. And I think through that conversation that lasted probably realistically about five minutes, which is a long time, both Dr. Kroll, myself, uh, weighed in on the importance of him to get vaccinated, both he and his fiance, uh, they have children. Uh, and so it really was something where we continue to impart the need to do this. I think at this point, we are beyond public policy. We are at the point where it's going to be those individual conversations with people, people who have already been vaccinated, who need to start reaching out, not only just to their family members and friends, but to simple strangers and talk to them about what it is that we know is going to help save this community and allow us to really get back uh, to where we were before the pandemic. And especially with the variants that are out there, we need to continue to remind people about the importance uh, of why you need to do this so that these other strains can't take hold and become another pandemic. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, because we had a conversation about this afterwards, Dr. Kroll and I, uh, just about the need for us to continue to push. Are there other best practices that you can give, uh, like Council Member Duando says, to the millions that are watching at home, but to all of us in, in all seriousness, about what it is that we can do outside of public policy uh, to make sure that we continue to impart on people the importance of getting vaccinated and why we need to do this now? Thank you, Councilmember Rice, uh, for your question, and also thank you for the conversation that you and Dr. Crowell had with that individual and hopefully uh, changed their mind to, to get them vaccinated and covered. I think the most important thing is that it's the type of conversations that you mentioned right now. You know, we, 
if you need a vaccine, and this is different from how it was before, if you need a vaccine, you can get a vaccine. They're, easy, they're much more easily available uh, to the broader public. Uh, and, and even within that, I think we you know, have to continue to be mindful if there are any types of obstacles or hindrances for any individuals to get vaccines. We'll continue to monitor that from a policy perspective and a logistics perspective. But realistically, they're broadly available and you know, there's lots of policies, there's incentives, there's all these things that have been put into place, but you're right, it's the, the individual conversations and engagement. And there have been a number of strategies thrown out. You know, I know at the federal level, there was conversations talking about utilizing barber shops and hair salons to be able to have those levels of conversations. I think it's, it's, it, so that's an example, I think, of creating spaces and tapping into venues that people readily use that are trusted sites where they feel comfortable having conversations to express their reticence. And I think one of the things in thinking about how you describe the interaction with all of you all at the conference was I would imagine that that young person uh, felt comfortable being able to say, yeah, I'm not vaccinated, here's why. And I think the most important thing is being able to create spaces where folks can have those candid conversations and say, well, you know, it's either my ideology or I, you know, had a bad experience, whatever the reason is to be able to have a dialogue and discourse around that to talk through those particular things. It's harder to do that in larger venues and groups. It's easier to do that when you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, um, you know, let me be clear, my attempt in the beginning was not to shame folks who are not vaccinated, but to clearly lay out that when we're seeing new cases, it's in certain groups, and that group happens to be those who aren't vaccinated. Um, so I think having, you know, creating spaces and venues to be able to have that level of conversation and discourse is meaningful, in addition to the continued larger efforts in terms of outreach, um, that you know, all of our community partners continue to engage in continuing, you know, and then for a small subset of folks, there are there do continue to be logistical issues in terms of getting them connected to the physical vaccine space. And we'll continue to work through that to make sure that they are proximate to the communities that need them the most, where uptake is lowest, uh, to ensure that you know those types of barriers aren't a reason why someone isn't able to get the vaccine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. Uh, thank you all for your um, great answers. Any other requests to speak? Uh, if not, um, as Council Member uh, Katz said, thank you all for your life-saving work. We're, um, this, we just continue to get great news from you and we really appreciate it because we know it doesn't happen by itself. It happens due to all your dedication and hard work. So thank you so much and we'll see you, uh, see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, stay safe. Uh, item number three is an update on our recovery efforts from COVID-19. I will recognize um, Ms. Michelson. Good morning. Um, as you will recall, a couple of weeks ago, um, when the council was getting its normal briefing, um, there was a brief reference to recovery, and I believe it was at that point that um, Council Member Navarro suggested that we have a more detailed presentation on the recovery issues since there wasn't enough time in the normal um, COVID briefings to discuss that. And uh, we have Dr. Stoddard here today to give you that presentation, so I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, and let me ask Councilmember Navarro, did you have any opening remarks? You did call for this. Well, other than I think it was important for us to have a little bit more time to, um, mm -hmm. you know, understand where we're where we are, where we're headed, also lessons learned, and whether there are particular um, proposals that we should examine regarding lessons learned through this pandemic and how we do our work as, as county government. Um, so I really do appreciate everyone who um, put this presentation together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'll start off actually where uh, Council Member Navarro ended, which is uh, with our lessons learned and, and, and talk a little bit about that process. So right now we have begun what will be the largest and most detailed after action process uh, for our response in, in the county's history. Uh, just to describe to you the way I, we've broken it down so far is that, you know, obviously our response phase is sort of waning down. We know the recovery will proceed for some time. And so we're going to do a response focused after action report. We're going to begin to collect, while doing that, begin to collect the data around recovery, but obviously with the recovery process continuing even as we speak, 
Obviously, I don't want to delay the process of starting our response focus to after action report while we do the continued work of recovery. And so my tentative timeline for the team that is working on that is to probably have a draft of the response focused AR by um, mid to late uh, September, September, and obviously share a draft with you with the council. Uh, the council will be engaged in this after action process, meaning you we're going to reach out to you all and start to get select, you know, solicit feedback as we are doing from both our county agencies, but also our nonprofits and other partners, hospitals across the board. Anyone who's involved in COVID 19's response will be receiving. Um, both an opportunity to sit down and talk to us, but also sort of some questionnaires and things like that to, sol to solicit information. Obviously, I've already encouraged all the partners who are normally on our Friday calls. Our last Friday call was actually uh, uh, the Friday before 4th of July. And so to sit down and begin to write, take notes on things that they think were important that we did right, things that were important that we didn't do right, and that we can improve on in the future, because I think that will be a very important part of our uh, improving the county moving forward. We do this kind of process every every time we have a major event. Th there has been no more major event than COVID-19 for Montgomery County, so we expect this process to be both lengthy and detailed and provide a number of recommendations for how we should do things better, both as a county government, but as, as well as interfacing with our nonprofits and other supporting uh, partners. So with that, I'm going to uh, share my screen and go through um, our recovery framework. I do believe I'll be joined by, uh, if I have not been already, a number of my colleagues from the recovery framework, because I'm going to try and keep this uh, shorter. There's a lot to cover with recovery. I don't want to, um, I don't want to speak the whole time and not leave opportunity for questions. And so um, I wanted to um, um, go that way. So everyone can see my slides, I assume. So, um, I want to talk about current challenges. So as you will recall, we've had a recovery framework in place. We were we were the first county that I'm aware of in the state of Maryland, certainly the first county in the National Capital Region to, to stand up our recovery framework. Um, and uh, obviously we uh, have, have been doing this for a very long time and trying to make sure that we're uh, well focused. But obviously now as uh, we proceed along, we want to we want to modify our framework to reflect where exactly we are in time. We're really transitioning from what we view, view as short-term recovery into intermediate recovery, and in some places, longer-term recovery. And so, obviously, we've we've focused down. We've had, as you recall, we had five mission areas: uh, government operations and services, housing, uh, economic revitalization, health and human services, and education. We're moving actually to a sixth uh, frame, sixth uh, mission area that you'll see described here. And here are the current challenges that we see really uh, as we move forward. And I'm just going to highlight a few of these because I think that many of them are self-evident. Uh, within the housing space, we know the moratoriums are coming to an end. That's going to be a major uh, area of focus within both uh, our Health and Human Services Department and the partners there, as well as our housing Department of Housing and Community Affairs, reflecting both on uh, the issues of the moratorium ended, eviction prevention dollars going out the door, and all those things. I know that you at uh, the Fed Committee and the HHS committees have a joint session on Thursday, I believe, uh, with DHCA to talk about the moratorium ending. So I, I'll, I'll certainly can take questions on that, but we'll, we'll not focus a ton uh, as that other session is coming up. On the economic revitalization side, obviously, we know that there's assessing business survival, what businesses did not survive, uh, workplace both shortages, but also discongruencies in, in work, work, worker skills is a major thing coming out of COVID. We know that we've been doing uh, job training and other efforts to try and address that. And, you know, obviously it's going to be a major area of focus to make sure that we're right sizing. We're trying to work with our community to, to make sure that the skills that are needed by our Montgomery County businesses are well aligned with the skills uh, that our, that our workers do have and doing training to, to address any gaps. Under health and human services, we know that behavioral and mental health is going to be a major issue. This includes uh, uh, issues of addiction, uh, particularly opioids and other um, um, drugs. And so obviously we, we, we know that's a mental health uh, issue, one that is reflective of the stress and pressures that many people have been under for the last 16 months. And we know that that's going to be a long uh, conversation to address as well. Uh, stress on health infrastructure. I think we talked about uh, even, I think, uh, Council Vice President Albernaz raised the question of mental health beds and, and beds in general in our hospitals. I know that's an area of future emphasis and one that we're concerned about as well. And then health equity, I, I, we could have a whole session on health equity and the, the um, 
the issues with health equity that have been laid bare in a really dramatic way by COVID-19 uh, in our Black and African American population, the disproportionate death, particularly early on in COVID, uh, some of the challenges in accessing health care for many communities, uh, many of our Black and Brown residents. This is a major issue. It was an issue before COVID, one that COVID has provided heck of a lot more data and uh, information about exactly the problems that we have. And so that will obviously be a focus. Um, we had, you know, the education mission area we had is education. And what we realized is we really needed a more holistic youth program, youth services program focused mission area. We had portions of child care that were underneath health and human services. We had uh, recreation and libraries activities under our government operations and services. And then we had education as sort of a standalone. The partners were talking, but obviously we just need to reflect the fact that this is a collaborative effort. It's a continuum. What happens in child care affect, affects what's happening in the schools. What happens in schools affects what's happening in our rec centers and libraries. And we can all be working synergistically to address both the education uh, deficits that COVID-19 has exacerbated, but also address um, the uh, socialization challenges that COVID-19 has, has introduced with people who, with children largely being um, isolated from one another to a much greater extent in the last 16 months than they would otherwise in this part of their, their, uh, their development. And then finally, uh, we've had the food security task force in place for well over a year now, addressing some of the food challenges in the county. We're really trying to move that uh, food food security task force into a longer term food resilience strategy to address the underlying uh, causation behind some of the some of the things that we observed this year to address the the inequity that exists within uh, the you know our community in terms of access to food to healthy food particularly and address the long term sustainability of such an effort. Obviously, we've we've taken uh, dozens of people from their from their normal activities and, and thrust them into this task force. Um, we've interacted with a tremendous number of nonprofits that uh, had uh, varying degrees of, of relationships with the county. And uh, we wanna make sure that we're um, making sure those are both maintained and codified for the long run so that we can have a much more sustainable food resilience program. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So um, key milestones, I, I, I think uh, I want to see if some of my colleagues have joined me, but if they have, I'm going to defer to them on occasion to uh, provide some of uh, some of these milestones, um, just to make sure that, you know, you're getting a sense for um, uh, some of the other things that are going on. I believe maybe some of them may be in the waiting room. I see Heather has joined us uh, from uh, the Food uh, Council. And so, uh, let's talk about economics first. So one of the big the big things that the economic revitalization mission area has been focused on is data collection and, and aggregation and analysis. And so what I mean by that is, is particularly with some of our earlier, the FEG grant programs and other uh, business assistance, we really had, we were under the t crunch of knowing that these businesses were being uh, hugely impacted. We wanted to get dollars out the door and the focus was on, was on speed rather than taking a lengthy time to understand exactly the data and analytics to, to say exactly where have we seen the impacts. And so what we've been doing in the in the, the, the last several months is working with the EDC as well as the planning uh, commission staff, looking at the data that is available to us in, in, in as close to real time as we can get, recognizing there is a lag in economic data to see which businesses have been negatively impacted, which businesses have been positively impacted, what shifts we're seeing in 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 things like uh, alcohol license uh, uh, renewals, data like that to understand exactly where are the places in our county in terms of economic sectors where we anticipate there being longer term impacts, and where are where are some industries where the economic the economic impacts are either have been short lived or are likely to uh, be less exacerbated than others. And so we've really been trying to be intentional and collect information with the ultimate. Um, um, goal of being able to provide both the council and the county executive information about if we have future programs using ARPA funds, I know you're going to hear about that at 1130, um, that we can have a more strategic uh, way of allocating those resources to most have the most effect and most benefit for the, for the community. And so um, we've been working closely with those organizations to collect more data, and we'll be able to talk a lot more about that as we, as we get our hands on um, um, that data in, in greater detail. Um, I also, uh, we are actually beginning to do a lot of surveying of, of our community to understand sort of the community level impacts and both the impacts on, on, on our consumers, I guess you could say, but also the workers in Montgomery County to understand what their behavioral changes may be post COVID. You know, for example, I know a lot of, you know, there's a lot of concern within the retail space about how many people are going to 
continue to do online shopping versus uh, supporting local small businesses through retail. And we want to understand what that dynamic looks like. How many people, you know, for example, because of their shifting uh, work requirements, many people are still doing telework. Or is that going to affect their their um, visits to a barber, for example? And that would obviously impact their personal services industry. And so we're looking very closely at some of those uh, elements to try and figure out exactly how we can improve um, those. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, I see both uh, Mark and Heather on from food. If you guys want to give a, some of the highlights from what you are working on with the food resilience uh, work as well. I'm not sure if Netta, Netta may be on as well. So uh, Mark or Heather. Yeah, Netta's on vacation this week. Uh, so it's just Mark and I. Good, after, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Mark, did you want to start or would you prefer that I? Uh, well, I will go ahead and get started just to indicate that we uh, deeply appreciate the bridge funding that was allocated by County Council uh, recently to extend uh, the efforts that the Food Security Task Force has been coordinating uh, to continue food security and food assistance programs in our county, recognizing that uh, the need is not decreasing um, and and continues throughout our county. Um, and so that includes our bulk food purchasing programs, partnerships with our um, both Mana Food Center and the Capital Area Food Bank uh, to ensure that our food assistance providers have access to the shelf stable goods that they need for distribution and continuing our um, produce procurement uh, to ensure that we have access to culturally appropriate foods uh, for distribution in our county's communities. At the same time, we're working with our food assistance providers to ensure that they have the increased operational capacity um, and trainings that they need to continue their work for those that wish to continue doing that um, in our recovery phase. So uh, we've been working with them on everything from um, uh, data uh, the collection and, and reporting strategies um, to working in particular with some of our um, Spanish language um, provider partners to ensure that they have the referral resources and tools that they need to connect residents to as many benefits and, and other resources as possible. Um, we're also continuing our farm to food bank uh, program and so working both with farms currently to purchase produce um, from county farms to ensure that it's distributed uh, throughout the county and a food assistance network that we have, uh, but then also um, continuing with a um, grant program, um, renewing the, the program that we had last year to build the capacity of our local farms to be able to expand their food production. Um, and we continue to convene our community and um, resident gardening programs uh, to give them the capacity they need to support residents in their um, in their production of food as well in their own communities. Um, and then uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Food for Montgomery is hosting an information session on their new resilience building grant program. And so the task force has been working really closely with Anna Hargrave and the Greater Washington Community Foundation uh, to provide this new um, grant program, which is really exciting and an opportunity to uh, support uh, organizations in a variety of ways. Um, those that have been doing grab and go methods um, and are looking to, in the recovery phase, pivot to a more um, case management approach uh, to connecting with residents and providing them with food assistance. Um, also for organizations that are looking at bringing innovative strategies, uh, maybe those that have been modeled in other places throughout the county or throughout the country um, and bring those strategies right here to Montgomery County, as well as organizations that are looking um, to collaboratively pursue those innovative of strategies and new ways of food security in our recovery phase. Um, and so the deadline for that grant program is in September to really give organizations the time they need to prepare thoughtful and comprehensive proposals. Uh, but that is um, something that we're really looking forward to um, connecting that Food for Montgomery resources to support our local residents as we look at what comes next. Um, and then we're also looking to uh, put together a comprehensive strategy for the recovery phase. Um, and, and we'll be connecting that with the overall recovery initiatives of the county. Thank you, Heather. And anything to add, Mark? Um, well, I missed all of that. So if I repeat anything that Heather just said, <laughs> as I was trying to. We see your computer. We don't oh. see you. <laughs> it still doesn't work. Um, so I will turn that off and you'll just have to hear my voice. Um, I, I'm, I really am young enough to understand computers. I just, <laughs> I'll blame the county network. Um, so the the one thing I do, I do want to um, just say um, is the 
is, is talk a little bit about the hubs um, in the food assistance um, process that or, or food assistance things that we've been doing um, in creating the eight hubs um, across the across the county. Um, we've seen um, all of them be highly successful, um, not just in the food assistance space, but in others as well, including um, adding case management um, for the families and indiv individuals that go to those hubs um, in, in providing services, um, not just around food, um, but some of the other needs that they may have. Um, and that case management um, that's being provided by um, uh, organizations like Impacts Over Spring and Catholic Charities and Interfaith Works um, has been um, crucial to the continued success of the hubs. Um, and so I'm happy to, to, to say that we'll be continuing that um, through FY22 um, with those um, with those same um, vendors, um, same same uh, nonprofits. Um, the food assistance piece um, continues to um, for the hubs um, continues to be the number one um, service that people are going to the hubs for. Um, but we are working um, closely with the hubs to start um, getting partnerships um, with Capillary Food Bank, with MANA, with Rainbow Community Development Center, with Nourish Now, some of the other larger nonprofit um, food assistance providers. Um, and so um, the hubs can um, do what the hubs were created to do, um, to create partnerships um, with a variety of nonprofits to provide um, a variety of services in those hubs. Um, and so um, to, to, to have those partnerships um, with um, Organizations like MANA um, or, or Capital Aid Food Bank um, is going to be uh, imperative for the continued um, long-term success um, uh, of the hubs um, and the sustainability of those hubs. Um, and I think that the same goes for the, the nonprofits um, in, in the community um, as, as, as the, the number of um, food assistance providers continues to, to, to drop now. Um, we had a lot of, of those who were added um, because their missions were able to be done um, during COVID. Um, so they went, they went to food. Many of them are now going back to their original missions um, and dropping the food assistance piece um, as the numbers of um, residents needing that food assistance um, drops in, in the community. So um, we're working with all of them. We continue to, continue to work with all of them um, to make sure that um, that one, the residents have access to the to the food that they need, um, but that the nonprofits are able to transition um, to back to their original missions um, or um, the other nonprofits to add more um, residents to their um, to their lists um, for, um, through referrals and, and things like that. So um, I just want to let you know that the Food Security Task Force um, and HHS continue to do, to work. Um, closely with with the nonprofits and with the hubs in the community um, to make sure that um, all of their needs are being met as well. Thank you, Mark and Heather. And I see um, both um, Amanda Harris and and Dr. Kroll. I'm not sure if you'd like to provide an update on um, the eviction prevention portion of the work the recovery framework is doing, or uh, in Dr. Kroll's case, if you want to provide an update on any of the other issues that the recovery framework. In the health and human services mission areas is addressing. Sure. Good morning. Why don't we start with uh, with eviction prevention and I'll let Amanda do the do that piece, and I'll come in with some of the other pieces of this. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I won't spend a whole lot of time on updates since there is a council session on Thursday. Uh, things are picking up uh, in the the COVID rent relief program. As of this morning, we have approved over seven million dollars in payments. Uh, so we are well exceeding our low bar of $1 million a week. That was a, just the floor. Uh, so uh, things are definitely picking up. Um, we continue to get new applicants each week. The program is still open. So I think the message to the community is if you are behind in rent, please apply. Um, we are pretty flexible with the way we determine income. So if you think there's any chance you might be eligible, please go ahead and apply. Um, we continue to do outreach. We do have staff at the courthouse now, so we are able to help people apply uh, on site. What we have seen so far at the court is that most people have already applied, um, but it is helpful for them to be able to check their status and then provide that information to the judge. Uh, we are also working with our partners that are doing housing counseling, so they are working with some of our harder to serve communities to assist people with applying. Um, we have 
done, I think, over 1,500 applications over the phone for people that had literacy, language issues, or poor internet access. So um, we feel pretty good that we are having uh, a significant reach into the community. I think that's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. You're uh, muted. I think Raymond, you're muted. Oh, yeah, that's good. I, I usually wouldn't be a Teams meeting or Zoom meeting if I didn't do that at least once. So um, the, the, um, the the broader pieces of this for recovery for HHS are, you know, pretty obvious. Anybody who's been watching us knows that we are still at the eye of, 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 of this, this storm as we were with actually testing the vaccination uh, phases of COVID. Um, the um, Two major areas for us, obviously, at this point, continuing work on public health and public health around testing and vaccination um, services, even though we are reaching, we've reached some critical and surpassed uh, critical milestones, we are still working to try to get to the new parts of the community that are still under vaccinated and maybe, maybe considered hesitant, but certainly, certainly uh, we are having to check, we're challenged to get to, to reach them. So, um, both partnerships with, uh, with the state are continuing, uh, and with the state and feds are, are winding down, but the state continues and we're continuing to partner with, with our, uh, minority health initiative and, and community partners to, to get vaccinations out and to do it in, in, uh, wherever we can in naturally occurring locations, uh, grocery stores, public events, um, ag fairs and festivals and such. So, so we will continue to do that piece of the work. We, we have uh, kept our health services open and running throughout most of the pandemic. And so that is, that is, um, um, there's no real news there. Uh, we are expanding and reopening and, and, and upgrading our dental services and our outreach services to make sure that, that, uh, that people can know about and can reach, get, get dental care as, as they need it. Uh, we are also, um, one of the things we added uh, and was fun, we were awarded funding this year to do was to, to create a, uh, a mobile HHS vehicle um, to, to be able to take services to remote locations where we can't necessarily reach. So we're, we're borrowing the lesson learned from, from testing and vaccination and applying it uh, more broadly to some of the basic health needs that, that, that community members have where transportation resources are limited and where there is need that's, that's, uh, that's high. Uh, as demonstrated by our community health needs assessment. Um, we went through a whole process of establishing and creating telehealth this year, both for on the healthcare side and on the mental health side. And I won't get into too many details around that, but to say that we have, we expect that that is something that we will continue to work on and, and, and expand um, as, as we go forward. We are reopening uh, and reopening all of our, our HHS offices and all of our front offices are open. Um, the schedule may vary and we usually post that, but the schedule is open to, to for folks who had act, trouble accessing us digitally through this process and are going online. So we'll be educating folks about online, but being available increasingly to the public so that they can walk in and, and come back in and get services in a way that is most comfortable for them. I anticipate we will continue to do both services uh, as, as we are likely, highly likely to continue doing teleworking for our, for our workforce in HHS. Um, on the behavioral health front, uh, there were three major goals in recovery, increasing public awareness, improving uh, client access to services, and doing more work on systems collaboration and identifying silos and gaps in services in, in the system, and, and then working on, on uh, how we address some of the equity issues that, that have emerged during, that have existed, but become blatantly apparent uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we have worked with aging and disabilities and expect to continue to do that to, to bring um, you know, individuals with comorbid conditions um, um, and, and into uh, into treatment and to get, make sure that we're outreaching to our older adults as we need to. Uh, we are, along with that, we're working with residential rehabilitation providers to provide uh, telehealth and, and, and do um, vaccination protocols and safety protocols in, in those facilities. Um, trauma services is going to be important for us um, in this coming in, in recovery because there are a lot of folks who are traumatized on a lot of different fronts, um, whether it's loss of, of, uh, of, of loved ones, um, re physical recovery, physical health recovery due to COVID, or uh, just simply loss of job and being isolated for many months. Um, so trying to make sure that we are connecting with, with, uh, with folks who are who have been traumatized uh, by COVID uh, and expanding capacity to do that is, is part of our recovery effort. 
um, courtroom links uh, throughout, throughout for, for domestic violence victims. We established um, links in Zoom for victim assistance to get to courthouse audiences to get to to uh, to, to the courts uh, and, and supported their efforts to get the peace and protective orders. I think that is likely to be a, a lesson, a, a piece that we will continue um, to to, um, uh, to make use of even post COVID. And then lastly, I'll finish with the, the, the crisis center. Uh, we started life, started a process of expanding the crisis center pre-COVID, uh, thanks to some some uh, initiatives, um, legislation, and funding provided through, uh, through Council President Hooker's office. Um, and wanted to let you all know that we continue to do that expansion. And the crisis center um, applied for a SAMHSA grant and just received notice that we are getting an additional 1.9 million dollars that we will use to expand crisis expansion, uh, crisis intervention services for folks. Uh, uh, who are experiencing mental illness and or who are homeless on the streets and the needs overlap to the community. So it's a needs overlap with the mental health team. Um, we continue to partner with fire and rescue and law enforcement to make sure that we are uh, increasingly front and center in, in being the uh, first responder um, for, those, for those needs um, that, that don't necessarily require law enforcement as, a, as an intervention. And then lastly, uh, working with behavioral health on, on schools and schools to try to make sure that as, as students come back into schools, both over the summer and as students come back into the schools, that they are uh, supported in their efforts to get back on track after having had a year of um, a challenging year academically and then being isolated. So that's our, our the broad strokes. There's a lot more detail, but I will stop uh, at that point turning back over to Earl. Yeah, and I just have a couple more slides to show, and then we'll get to questions. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for that. And so um, just quickly talking a little bit about this, this gives you some sense of where we're at in terms of timelines. Um, obviously, we're transitioning from short-term recovery to intermediate recovery right now. Our goal is to put ourselves as a recovery framework out of business. And what I mean by that is um, we should be integrating these, these important uh, processes into the way we do work on a normal basis, and they shouldn't be in a standalone uh, uh, framework. And so my goal is to push – as many of these things into interagency uh, efforts or inter or inside of department efforts or partnerships between part, uh, departments and, and nonprofits and others uh, as we can by the end of the year. And so there may be some uh, elements of the framework that persist into 2022, but my goal is to get as many of them into a longer term, more sustainable uh, model uh, by the end of the year as, as possible. Some will transition much sooner than the end of the year, to be clear. Uh, others will take a little bit longer because they're a little bit more detailed and require a little bit more um, uh, coalition building around the efforts. As I talked about with the economic re revitalization missionary, data collection and analysis has become a big portion of what we're doing. Uh, this is this is true across the food uh, provision. This is true across our, our mental and behavioral health. It, it's, a, it's true in every mission area where we're really trying to get more um, focused with the data and understanding exactly what the impacts of COVID-19 are. Uh, and, and, and using every method we can to access that data, both from information that's available to the county, the state, and others. Uh, we are also integrating uh, human behavioral science. And so we talked about this with our vaccination effort previously. We've really had great success in trying to utilize some additional, um, you know, how, how do we make the messaging better or more received by the public? And we've used behavioral health science to try and improve that. So we're actually trying to model that uh, success into our recovery framework. Uh, Michael Baskin in the county executive's office has been very interested in doing this, and we're sort of partnering with him to begin to take what he had been doing before COVID and really use uh, the recovery framework as a model to integrate long-term behavioral science into what we do more of in the county. And obviously, we'll be transitioning, demobilizing, integrating, uh, adding, subtracting work groups as time goes along. Um, and obviously, um, that'll that'll be a you know missionary by missionary. Uh, program by program effort. I won't belabor to go through the whole the whole chart with you. I just will remind you that our recovery framework is uh, pretty robust. It includes all the way up to the county council and county executive, all the way down to the individual working groups. I'm not gonna ask you to see these. I just wanted to show you the overall structure to show you that there is a remote, robust recovery structure that we've had in place. It's, been, it's being modified currently. This is the bottom that's a lot more focused on what we've talked about today. And you can see the mission area uh, and the team leads for each of the respective um, work groups and mission areas. Um, and then I will stop there and we can take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Stoddard and all of you. Uh, Councilmember Novato. Thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate Dr. Stoddard, uh, Ms. Braskins, Dr. Cole, everybody who presented. Um, this, I uh, think, has been so robust and it shows that um, this is a government that didn't wait until a particular moment to think about all these issues. Uh, they have been juggling everything, meaning the emergency response, but also thinking through what is next. And I know for me personally, that was a very important component of um, dealing with this crisis, this, this notion of we have to prepare for post-COVID. What would that look like? What does that mean? So I, I guess I just, I, I want to take a step back and just ask, I guess, a much more macro um, question. Um, and it has to do with the notion that, um, of course, we are all very familiar with the many disparities that existed pre-COVID-19. Those obviously came into full um, view during this pandemic. And it was not, of course, just in terms of health, but it was in all of the categories that we could imagine. Um, and so I want to park that and then think through um, Montgomery County's demographics um, and also the uh, geographic areas that we kept tracking as being the most impacted. Um, so in your thinking through all of these recovery work groups, I'm wondering then, uh, and I'm glad to hear Dr. Stoddard that you said that there would be sort of a transition into a more kind of longer term um, work here, but how, who is basically um, leading, I guess, the exercise of taking that step back and saying, okay, we know we've got these geographic areas where obviously we need more economic development. Um, we know that we have particular communities that um, had these disparities, now they're exacerbated. Uh, and therefore, in my opinion, it calls for a complete overhaul of how we have operated up until now. Um, you know, issues of scalability, issues of targeted investments, understanding that if we don't invest in areas of the county um, where we have, where we continue to lack uh, jobs, you know, companies moving there, particular infrastructure and amenities, that if we don't do that, the next time we have a crisis, we will be back into this reactionary space. I'm just curious as to whether there has been a conversation about kind of a radical shift in, um, in taking in the lessons learned during this pandemic and doing the work radically different. Um, I know that when we talk about uh, the ARPA funding, you know, there was a there was a document that was forwarded to us by Ms. Dr. Elaine Bonner Tompkins from the Office of Legislative Oversight and how we can integrate priorities, advancing racial equity through the American Rescue Plan. But to me, it's all very much embedded. We can't talk about a vibrant Montgomery County post-COVID-19 recovery without acknowledging and owning the fact that if we continue to do the same things we've always done, you know, the same service models, the same sort of responses, you know, the same not at scale type of uh, responses and investments, um, we will continue to perpetuate a status quo that reveals um, exacerbated disparities across all policy areas. So I'm just curious as to who's owning that and, um, and, and what thoughts do you have about some, you know, overhaul, reorganization, retooling, targeted investments um, so that we are not in the same situation we were pre-COVID-19. Yeah, I th uh, thank you very much for the question, Councilmember Navarro. I think uh, I think everything you said is is definitely point well taken, and and there's a couple of things I wanted to say. Uh, so first off, we do have a recovery executive committee where we're talking about these big grand issues. There is representative both from the council as well as the county executive and, and senior. All the missionary team leads come together. and We discuss these big target issues. Now, obviously, that kind of a gathering isn't going to be the vehicle to address all of these kinds of issues because they're going to require um, massive change and uh, a lot of thinking through what that change will look like. And so 
Uh, we talked a little bit about the the after action process in the beginning. I think we've ne- we've never done an after action process for a recovery event. We've never had a recovery event of this magnitude, and so I would expect a lot of the the kinds of the the, the work that you're focused you're, you're thinking about here is going to be reflected in that recovery related after action report to reflect. Okay, this is the lessons learned from this event as it relates to co- recovery. Here are the things that we learned about the impacts to our community, and here's our roadmap moving forward. Uh, that's kind of why I think that the recovery after action report and, and, and corrective action plan will be a, take a little bit longer to do because there's a lot to unpack in terms of the, the, both the data we need to understand of the impacts and also the recommended actions that will be taken thereafter to address those impacts. And so I do think that's going to be the right vehicle. And as I said in the beginning, that's going to require integration, not just from the executive branch offices, but also our nonprofits, health sector, the council and and, and everywhere in between. And so I think that's the right vehicle to have this conversation. It's going to require, um, I think, I, I mean, the, everything you said, we're going to have massive change that's going to come as a result of this. And I, and I think that certainly um, we're, we're interested in that. I also want to make clear, uh, we obviously had a huge change in our regional service center directors over the last, uh, you know, several months. And uh, obviously there's real opportunities there with with the reappointment of, of of four additional regional service center directors to help us with some of this uh, implementation and integration of some of these uh, some lo- long term recovery lessons as it relates to specific parts of the county and the disparate impacts that have been experienced in those parts of the county. So I think Dr. Kroll also has has uh, some feedback you want to provide on that. So uh, thanks, Earl. Uh, Councilman Navarro, I think the, there are a couple of things from my perspective. One is just a note again about the impact of racial equity and social justice in the act that was passed and the, and, the, and the fact that it has driven and guided a lot of our work this last year. If you look at the data that we used and the, data, the way we used the data that we had available to address those impacts around COVID, you get a good sense of, of, of what I'm talking about and how we were able to successfully use that, that, that data um, to make decisions about what got funded and where we funded things. And even now where we are providing services and how we're outreaching to the community, both from from testing and vaccination to consolidated hubs. Um, and, and that work, I expect, will, will continue. You know, I certainly can't speak to all the economic issues that you raised. I think there's some systemic, some fundamental systemic issues that we're going to have to continue to, to, to take on. Um, but when I look at, at, at what the direction the county is moving in, I talked to the Department of Environmental Protections and their, and their equity plan and their equity framework. I see synergy some movement in the right direction that we now have to figure out how to synergize and, and, and integrate the, the work of um, the, the recovery executive committee and i think the after action process will, will be good points starting points for building a, a, a more complete picture of what that re, redevelopment or re, re, re framework um, that, that reimagined process needs to look like for the county but i don't think that we are no one that I'm talking to is waiting for that process to be completed. We're doing things now um, that, 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 that acknowledge the disparities and inequities that we saw uh, in our departments and, and certainly in HHS trying to understand how we, how we think about uh, who's being served, who didn't get served, where they didn't get served, and, and how they didn't get served as I think about future budgets that years and programming years for this department. So it's underway. It is not. Um, like everything in government it takes time to meld it and, and braid it together. But I think that, that the recovery committee and the after action process will help us to do some of that as we go forward. Thank you. And I apologize. I think my internet uh, connection is a little unstable, but um, I, I will, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and we should at every step of the way be cognizant of how fortunate we were to have done this collective work on racial equity and social justice in terms of the legislation where we are much uh, a lot, you know further along than so many other jurisdictions in this work um and last i'll close by saying that i do think we have some very pivotal lessons um one of them of course was i think for nuestra salud y bienestar as well as the african-american health program and how quickly those came to be and how effective they were and i think they came to teach us that when we engage the community, when we give them a front seat in terms of leading some of these very complex um, issue, you know, programs, et cetera, that the, that the results will, are apparent and are very impactful. And I, and I think we can learn from a lot of that kind of approach. Um, 
regional services centers. I agree. I think that, you know, there had been some conversations about some restructuring that I don't think that happened, but, you know, that is going to be really critical. Um, and lastly, uh, hope that we understand that we have got to shift and pivot in terms of how we do outreach, how we do engagement um, in our communities, communities that are now very quickly becoming the majority. Um, and so just, you know, outreach alone is not enough. We have to do the engagement and the communication and make sure that they are partners with us. So a lot of great work ahead, very exciting things. Um, and um, just, you know, a big sense of gratitude to all of you for, again, just, you know, rolling up your sleeves and stepping up and putting us in a much better position that, that many other jurisdictions. And now it's up to all of us collectively to take that and, and you know, take it to the next level and, and invest where we need to invest up front and solidify what we need to solidify uh, from technology to bringing jobs to making sure that everybody has access to opportunities and that racial equity and social justice is not seen as some effort to only talk about, you know, handouts or only emergency relief assistance, that it's also about building those opportunities through economic development, through jobs, uh, through a vibrant economic centers. It's all connected. And I, and I think that Montgomery County can demonstrate that and lead in that uh, space. Uh, here in the region and the countries. So thank you so much. I look forward to all the work ahead. Great. Thank you. Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you. I very much associate myself with all of the questions and comments from Councilmember Navarro and thank yes. her for um, requesting this update and briefing. And I think all of my colleagues were directly involved with one, most, or all aspects of the plan that was presented this morning. Uh, whether it be through our staffs or our central office, uh, participating in different meetings, troubleshooting, coordinating efforts, trying to connect to the state, trying to connect to the federal government. It was an all hands on deck all the time. And it was really Herculean, frankly, uh, the efforts that were underway um, by everyone involved. And this presentation is excellent in that it, it, it gives us an ability to be able to more clearly process um, the complex and vast system that all had to come together quickly uh, to address what was obviously unprecedented. And having spent 12 years in the executive branch, one of the ongoing frustrations I had was, you know, the siloed approach to service delivery. Um, you know, with the best of intentions, we, we try to, we end up focusing on things through our respective lens. And this forced us uh, to break down those silos in ways that I'd never seen before uh, and that were pretty dramatic. Um, and so the cross collaboration among agencies, the community, sister county agencies, the state um, is something that we need to keep moving forward with um, because it, it helps us broaden the scope and better understand what will be necessary and continue this all hands on deck approach, uh, which I think is going to be instrumental. So the other and just a couple more comments and I did have a couple questions. Um, the other thing that I think we need to be intentional about is uh, really emphasizing innovation. Um, there was a lot of uh, really interesting, not just innovation through a technology framework, but innovation through uh, a collaboration and coalition building framework um, that we're going to want to expand upon as well. And it, it's so important that I don't think we can just sort of assume or organically embed it uh, within each of these respective buckets or categories that have been listed here, um, I think there's an opportunity for us to be more intentional about having sort of a standalone group or body. Um, and, and we've already seen some really strong evidence of that. Uh, we had a great joint committee session with HHS and our Government Operations Committee to get an update on MC311. Um, and that was an example of, of that innovation happening in real time. Um, and it's something that I know Councilmember Navarro has been pushing for, for for a long time and is really coming to fruition. Um, but I, I think that that needs to be, in my opinion, teased out more intentionally because uh, that, you know, there there will be some potential funding opportunities uh, with federal grants uh, that we may be able to access. And that connects to my, my next broader point, which is going to lead to a couple of questions. I, I have seen clear evidence that... People are exhausted 
uh, um, people in these positions, both frontline positions, coordinator positions, are burning out and have burned out uh, and have hit walls. Uh, and we're starting to see evidence of, of people leaving uh, uh, these fields um, and, and transferring to something else or retiring early. And so I, I do think that's something that we have to bear in mind because we can have the greatest system in place in the world, but uh, if we don't have the right people in the right seats and, and on the bus uh, uh, and generally, uh, then we're not going to be able to carry out some of these efforts. So could we talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to support our frontline uh, staff and organization leaders, uh, including, frankly, all of you um, that have been working around the clock now for, for well over a year and a half uh, and have felt the full weight of everything that, that has been felt. Um, Dr. Kroll and I have talked about this many times. He's been terrific uh, in promoting health and wellness within HHS, as, as our colleagues and other departments have as well. Um, but if we could just talk a little bit about that, because I think it's key and a fundamental aspect to be able to implement the plan that you've presented here. Sure, I'll start. I'm sure uh, Raymond will have some additional comments on this. So I think I mean, what, what you said is extremely important. So one thing we've been emphasizing is as we as we wind wound down our response calls and our response focus on COVID-19, not to say that we're not still doing some activities, but uh, the clear message that we've been providing and, you know, came even the county executive came and spoke to our last response call and uh, he encouraged people take leave, get away from it, think about other things. Uh, number one, just in terms of like, you know, people, uh, people's own personal mental health. The other thing we've been doing in the recovery framework is really trying to space out some of the activities because this is a much more protracted long-term type focus to give some people some latitude to think about something other than COVID-19 because they've had a whole bunch of things that they stopped doing at, during the pandemic, give them the bandwidth, time, and opportunity to think about other things, to engage other parts of their brain that they have not engaged or have not fully engaged because of the pandemic. Uh, that said, I still do believe we are going to see turnover. This is true. This has been true in every uh, event uh, that I've studied and been part of. You know, after these huge traumatic long-term events, you will see change. People see it as an opportunity for doing something different. I think we're seeing this in the general population. I think in large part, for example, you know, um, you know, I know the governor's taking his action as it relates to un uh, the unemployment insurance benefits and to try and drive people back to the workforce. But I think some of the people not going back in the workforce is more about them assessing where they were at pre-COVID and seeing this as an opportunity to make a change in their own life that they may not have felt comfortable doing before. And I think you're just seeing this natural um, sort of a, a bit of upheaval, which again, uh, had, you know, we lose institutional knowledge, we lose other things in terms of benefits of people who have had experience, but also, you know, you get, you get new people in who have, fresh perspectives and, and, and uh, energy. So it's sort of a natural thing uh, that we expect will happen. We are definitely trying to encourage people. We've seen a huge uptick in, for example, the Live Well program where people have been participating more since the introduction of remote uh, uh, health activities within county employees. And certainly, you know, that's obviously a good thing to see and it will help us in, in terms of long-term programming. But obviously just encouraging those opportunities, people to take leave, people to get away from, from um, thinking about COVID specifically, getting thinking about other things are all part and parcel with encouraging people to think about their own mental health. I mean, I, I can't I can't tell how many times during the pandemic I, I try to remind people, you know, every week as we're going through this, talk to somebody, figure look for look for your 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 not your just your coworker, your peers, your partners to to you know make sure that they're practicing good mental and physical health, uh, which are just, you know, part of sustaining such an effort. But now that we've sustained it, and we're getting towards the end of it, people have got to take some time away and, and sort of separate themselves mentally from some of these things. Dr. Kroll. So, so I, yeah, I would add just, just a couple of things. Obviously, you all have listened to me talk to the community, talk to the public, and talk to you all about taking breaks and taking time out and, 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 and turning off and disconnecting digitally, especially from some of uh, some of the ongoing, never-ending news cycle that, that has added to, to the level of stress, um, along with all of the, the inequities and racial issues, injustice, injustice issues that we've been facing, just being able to step back and turn that off for a little while has been has been vital to, to, to my mental health and mental health of everybody on this call. I think um, the we have been, I have literally been nudging and pushing my staff out the door to go on leave and take breaks and, and get away from this. 
and making it a point to, one, space out when I talk to them, to be very careful about not texting, emailing them at all godly hours of the night, except for Amanda, whom I like to mess with periodically. But also, the telework issue is going to be important for us, because one of the things, a couple of things we learned about telework. One was that it increases, in some cases, our level of efficiency, and in some cases, people have a hard time, have struggled with trying to figure out how they keep themselves on task and working. But there has been some research that I have been looking into in the last week or two around the life, quality of life perceptions of people who are in telework, and that there's an opportunity to increase quality of life for people so that it becomes a less stressful way of working and a more flexible way of working. We're going to have to continue to explore that and look at those schedules and ways and set up things in ways that hopefully give people some greater flexibility in their work schedules and their work lives, and at the same time, manage the need for having folks back from office, obviously, to do some of the service that needs to happen. I think the biggest challenge that we face now is, well, just in terms of staff capacity and staff burnout, is helping folks now figure out where the boundaries of work and the rest of your life lie. Certainly, telework makes it possible to go nonstop. We've got some lessons to learn around the use of this technology. We've gone to a model where people had, from a model where people had 10 minutes to transition between meetings to where we pivot, we pivot, we pivot, we pivot, we pivot from thing to thing. There's no break, no transition time, no time to reflect and adjust and adapt and process what just happened before you get to the next meeting. That's not going to be healthy for our folks in the long run. So we've got to figure out a way how policy-wise and procedurally-wise, how we manage that kind of, this kind of distant technology. I think that, to Dr. Stoddard's point, every crisis or traumatic event of history that I've been involved in, going all the way back to Katrina, there has been staff burnout at the point in time where staff have said, I can't do this anymore, I have to go into something else. And that, I expect that will happen here. Our task now is to figure out how do we bring new talent in in a way that is, that is, that complements our existing folks. And at the same time, be gentle with the folks who decided this and understanding of the folks who have decided it's time to change. I appreciate that. I know you guys are really thinking a lot about this, clearly, and whatever we can do, clearly as well, we would like to support. My final point is, the other thing that came to light through the last year and a half is sort of the regulatory and policy issues that are beyond the county's control, that really make it more difficult for us to be able to effectively carry out service delivery and provide the level of direct service and care that we know we need and we'd like to be able to provide. So I'd like to request that as we continue the implementation of this plan, that somebody be focused on or responsible for carrying essentially a running tab of those policy issues that we need to reconnect with our state delegation regarding. There's a lot of stuff in the homeless space. There's a lot of issues in the behavioral health and mental health space here and capacity issues that are going to have to be done concurrently in order for us to be able to be effective. So I don't know who that is. Maybe it's Melanie Wingershop, who's terrific, but and should be more, but we need to be intentional about this so we don't lose this momentum to be able to address some of this change because we've gotten people's attention on the importance of public health as a whole and why some of these systemic issues really impact communities. So, you know, just from HHS's side, I think Melanie Wingering and Alyssa Fry from my staff are two folks who've been working on this issue kind of continuously. So it will be a small task for them to continue to pull together a summary of the things that made it a more challenging process than it needed to be. And along with potentially some suggestions about what the proposed change might look like. Yeah, I was just going to simply add, we're looking at it in the economic space too. I mean, I've already had conversations this morning about the outdoor dining and continuance of some of those things, the streeteries, the issue of alcohol in the parks, lots of things that we know that are, you know, 
tied that were, were, were allowed by the state of emergency, but now need to be allowed by by changes that in, in, in state or potentially in some cases county code as we identify those, those are things we're absolutely flagging will be part of the corrective action. We're, I fully expect we're going to have a number of legislative changes that we are going to suggest as a result of COVID-19 that we're going to aggregate. And that will be, uh, as you know, um, from participating in our recovery executive committee, uh, Melanie and her team are regular uh, port participants in, in those meetings and we get updates from them about the opportunities, as you said, for grants and other things down from the federal government, but also we work with them closely to identify legislative changes that we really want to push uh, based on our experience with COVID-19. So I absolutely agree with everything you said. Great. Well, thank you both. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, Council Member Friedson. Thank you, uh, Council President. Thank you to Council Member Navarro for requesting the, the briefing and um, you know, thank you to Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Kroll and uh, Ms. Harris, Mr. Hodge, Ms. Bruskin and everybody, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, this has been an incredibly challenging year. We faced issues that nobody ever expected uh, to face, questions that uh, nobody in uh, any setting, much less at the local government level, would have even had to, to fathom. And uh, there was a lot of hard work and some mistakes and uh, issues along the way, but uh, I think we have gotten to uh, a pretty solid place from, from where we, we were and where we might have been, and it's thanks to a lot of hard work, a lot of collaboration. But I, I also really do appreciate the fact that you're undertaking the after-action report work, Dr. Stoddard, and that you're leading that uh, effort. I know we all have faith in your uh, leadership skills, your sobriety and honesty in the way that you address uh, those issues, because uh, unfortunately, it also exposed a lot of things as well, uh, not just uh, in society, but in county government. The fact that, uh, as uh, Councilmember Navarro noted, the, the outreach and engagement and communications apparatus was not sufficient to the modern needs of Montgomery County. And that's not just true of uh, the communities that were hardest hit, uh, that we have traditionally done a poor job of reaching. It was true of everybody. Uh, we, we did not have a way to reach most people, most nonprofit organization, most um, employers. Uh, and so it, it created a huge challenge and we'll never be able to catch up during a crisis. And so we have to be caught up before the crisis so that we can actually manage the crisis and not have to fix the problems that we didn't fix uh, prior to it. So I think that work is going to be uh, absolutely essential. I, I look forward to it. Uh, and, and to seeing that report and then figuring out how we operationalize that. And I would just broaden it uh, to the fact that um, the, the communities that we didn't reach uh, were all communities and those uh, hardest uh, uh, hit communities were the, were the worst impacted by those failures and had the least access uh, to that. And so we have to really focus on just making everything better and then really focusing on those uh, who too often have been uh, left out and, and left behind and, and don't have the access uh, that they would that, that they would otherwise uh, need. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the, the interest in incorporating some of the successes into the business as usual, some of the processes into the business as usual. And I really wanted to focus on that. And then uh, also this idea, you mentioned some of them uh, just recently Dr. Stoddard in your last remarks, uh, but the culture of yes that we got to and the elimination of silos, we were forced through desperation to do that, but we shouldn't have to be forced through desperation to start with a culture of yes, of solving the problem and figuring out how to get there and being willing to let our guards down and our uh, silos down to be able to make it happen. I don't think we do it well uh, generally uh, in government broadly and in large institutions, private sector as well. Uh, we need to do better at that. And so I think that your report is really going to help us uh, to think through that. Uh, my specific question uh, is related to all of that. The recovery work groups, I think, were really valuable. I served on you know, all of the, the business and economic related uh, work groups. I think they were a really terrific collection of people uh, and of organizations and a wide breadth of the community that was represented. Uh, but I did think at times we we're talking at them and it's telling them what was happening and it was a report out uh, and it wasn't as collaborative as it could be. Uh, and I just wanted to find out from, from you, Dr. Stoddard, 
uh, how do you anticipate using those groups that have already been established as part of the work that you were talking about uh, to ensure that we are reaching folks in the community well, both to, to, to develop that corrective action plan and to think through, you know, what the next step looks like, uh, but also perhaps just as importantly, if not more importantly, uh, to make groups or groups like them, you know, part of the way that the county does business and engages with relevant stakeholders in a normal time, not just in a crisis. Couple, yeah, there's a couple things I want to unpack there. So I think uh, one of the things that I recognize, particularly with the economic revitalization missionary, and you sort of noted this in your comments, is when we created these work groups that were focused on recovery, because we didn't have the strongest relationship we should have with the businesses before COVID, they, they became a uh, they became very different from recovery focused groups. They often were dealing with you know real time. Uh, business restrictions from from uh, whether it be the state, county, or uh, otherwise, uh, they were focused on a lot of issues that we probably should have had apparatus to engage with them on outside of COVID, um, so that we wouldn't had to you know have the recovery missionaries become the sort of sort of uh, substitute methodology for them to engage with the county government on a whole host of issues. And so I think your point, your, your, to your point, if we had had some of those infrastructure pieces that more developed in, in, I think we would have had a better experience with the recovery groups themselves and not have been so, um, you know, uh, almost paternalistic in nature where they're talking, we're talking down to them. And I think that more participation. So I think moving forward, a couple of things, I think from the economic groups, I think that the, um, the, the economic side is going to be very interesting because now businesses really just want to go back and be operating and, the, you know, now there's their opportunity to make up ground and things like that. And so we've been trying to give the businesses a little bit more space to operate without having to have these meetings with regularity. But in my view, we need them, uh, as I've said with the data collection analysis portion of this, we need that feedback to understand where Montgomery County is moving economically long term so that we can implement programming as it relates to uh, job worker training and, and a whole host of other other uh, other supports for the business community. We need to understand what they're seeing on the ground, what they're experiencing, what shifts they've seen, where their challenges lie. And so I would expect that moving forward with the recovery framework, particularly in the economic sector, it's going to be a whole lot more hearing from them than it will be from hearing from county government, just by nature of the fact that we, you know, not to say we didn't need before, as I said before, I think a lot of it was back and forth about the restrictions, which again are not in place now. So there's a lot more bandwidth to have a much more constructive conversation focused on where do we go from here and what do you need from the county or other agencies that work with the county to improve your opportunity moving forward to be successful. And I think that's going to be a much greater area of focus um, in the economic space just moving forward and understanding exactly, you know, we may need to reconfigure some of those groups in terms of their, their composition. As we get more of this data, we may say, oh, this sector has been hugely impacted. We need more representatives from this sector. And I think that will certainly inform the composition and nature of the conversations as we do some of these data analyses. You know, we're already, we're already moving along. We've got some data on what we're seeing so far. It's just the, the, we're trying to understand, you know, where where is where is the data settle out as it relates to our uh, economic sector in terms of what do we expect, you know, our short term impacts versus more intermediate or longer term impacts. So, Councilmember Prison, before you before you before you go off, just just this, I see this in a lot of two different dimensions. One of them obviously is the economic vital, revitalization of, of, of the business community, but the other one is you know, is is revitalization of our workforce. Um, and to, to uh, Councilmember Navarro's question, comment earlier about our systems and, and figuring out where the jobs are, where the people are who have, who have uh, the skills necessary or who could be trained and, and, and pulled into that workforce. If we're uh, truly interested in sort of doing some, uh, doing some rebuilding, I'm hoping that we will, we will take advantage of some of those existing structures that are out there now. Workforce Development Board is one that comes to mind for me just as, as a, as a, as a as an opportunity to pull that group into some of this recovery conversation so that they are with businesses talking about where the needs are, where the, where the, where the opportunities are to, to grow our own our workforce from within the county. We've got, we've got people um, that, that, that I think are, will be looking for jobs and opportunities for professional, personal development. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. And I think the third piece, uh, in addition to the workforce related to this, are the nonprofit partners not as 
employers, which of course they are, and they had been participating in that piece of it, but as service delivery, uh, you know, part of the service delivery, that, that network expanded tenfold or, or more, and I think we need to keep, uh, you know, that uh, available. I was reminded late at night watching TV in the background as I was answering constituent emails, the emergency broadcasting system tests, you know, that happen uh, in the wee hours of the night. We do that when there's not a crisis to make sure that when there is a crisis, we can reach the public. And we need to do more of that in, in county government to test the systems that we have to make sure we're reaching the folks we need to reach, particularly those we have traditionally done a lousy job of reaching to make sure that when we need to do it, we should be doing it all the time, but particularly when we desperately uh, need to do it when it's a life or death situation like a crisis uh, as we were just in, uh, that we're prepared and ready to do it. And the last thing that I will say is the relationships the, the political relationships at the you know, state and federal level, the relationships in the community, uh, those can't be built during a crisis. And so we really have to hone in and focus and build systems uh, that, uh, that that have those uh, established. I think that we've gotten to a better place now, but it was a bumpy road uh, along the way, and we need to smooth that road out. I think that your work will, will help us do, do that. So I, I really do look forward uh, to that. I will thank you again. Uh, for this, this crisis didn't create new uh, issues. It mostly exposed existing uh, issues. And uh, now that we've been confronted with them, I think we have uh, a better understanding of what those challenges are. And, and I know we're all committed to, to addressing them together. So thanks for all of your hard work and look forward to continuing to coordinate, collaborate, and to use this crisis as an opportunity to be a better county government and uh, serve the community in a better way. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. So I'm not going to harp on too much of what's already been said. Let me just say this, that, you know, a lot of our jobs are going away. Uh, so, so they're not going to come back. Um, we've accelerated, and we were just having this conversation at the NACO conference, we've accelerated uh, a lot of digitizing of our workforce economy uh, by the tune of five to 10 years, just over this one and a half years of the pandemic. And so, from that perspective, it means a lot in terms of where our folks are going to be. Oftentimes, those that were in some of our lower skilled uh, jobs that then were replaced by technology during this time frame, they're not going to go back to those jobs. And so we need to be prepared to get those folks into the workforce immediately. When we talk about rental assistance, when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about all those things, and that's why I love what Councilmember Navarro said at the outset. Um, it really is important for us to pre-plan that. And Dr. Pearl, I couldn't agree with you more. It's that pre-planning of what it is. That's why I'm happy that Montgomery County made the investment in the coding hub. Uh, and we'll see that come to fruition later on this fall and more to come on that. That's going to be instrumental in terms of really giving uh, folks an opportunity to break into these new fields uh, that are out there that are now the norm. That was something that, that was thought of as, oh, you know, years from now, we'll we'll see these things happen, but they're happening right before our very eyes. Um, you know, digitizing of driver's licenses. I don't know if people are following what's happening across the country, but that's already happening. And so what does that mean for MBA? Many of our folks who are local, uh, who work in Montgomery County at the local MBA, those jobs are gone. I mean, there's so many things. You could go across every single spectrum, uh, just as Dr. Kroll said, even in his own department as we look towards technology and those sorts of things. It's gonna be, you know, the, those are gonna be so internally within our own government structure. And so we've gotta be robust in terms of not only our efforts, but our planning when it comes to making sure that we're preparing our folks for uh, these jobs, not of tomorrow, of today. Uh, and so from that perspective, I just look forward to uh, hoping that we're gonna be using some of our ARPA funds uh, and leveraging that uh, to make sure that we can heavily invest in workforce development. We've got to make sure that our re-entering citizens, uh, you know, long gone are the days where we just teach you about, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not digging my wife here, but, I mean, you know, training for cosmetology and for, you know, all kinds of other things are great. There's so many other technology careers that are out there as well that we also need to prepare folks for. We shouldn't be just siloed in terms of just saying this. So our re-entering citizens that are coming out of our jails, we need to be giving them options and giving them ways to go too if we care about crime and we care about recidivism. So there's so much, right, um, that we can get right 
Uh, and I think that as Councilmember Navarro said, if we're true in our equity uh, purposes, that we need to evaluate it from that perspective and ensure that, you know, just because of a person's circumstance, just because of uh, where they were born, uh, how much money in the, they have in their pocket is not determining their outcome of their future. And we can do that uh, if we get this right now. Uh, and so I hear from all of my colleagues, I just want to thank each and every one of you because I agree with everything that you said. Uh, and it shows that Montgomery County is, I agree, poised to be better uh, than so many other communities across this country. We just got to now do it. So thanks, guys. Thank you for everything that you guys have done and talked about. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, also appreciate all the comments that have previously been made. Um, wanted to ask a specific question and make a comment. Uh, Dr. Stoddard, who, sit, who sits on the uh, your recovery framework from the council? Uh, so, uh, council President Hucker and, and typically more, more typically uh, Council Vice President Albert Oz attends the recovery executive committee meetings, uh, uh, but staff, I believe, from both uh, members uh, Vice President, Vice President, regularly attends. Okay. And then Ms. Michelson obviously up. also attends as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I bring it up because, you know, I am I am very just personally unfamiliar with what comes out of those meetings. Um, and so I, I, I did, I think, I didn't even know the answer to that question when I asked you, to tell you the truth, and I'll be transparent. So I, I think we have to have a better, a much better process, um, and I don't blame our president and vice president, I think we just need to, you know, and this is maybe directed to Ms. Michelson, we need to have a process by which we are getting information as it's happening, particularly as we head into this recovery. I mean, because it's it's just going to be, there's so much, this, this conversation has, we've scraped the surface, we've demonstrated how much there is to keep a track of and to keep an eye on. And you all are, I think, thinking about all the right things. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there because I, you know, I, I want to feel more connected to it and, and be able to provide input in real time. So we, we need to just figure out a better way to do that. Um, I will say, you know, we got a great document and we'll talk more about this from our OLO uh, office yesterday, Dr. Elaine Bonner Tompkins talking about uh, laying out some of policy links recommendations around how to have an equitable recovery. It's something we all want, we're all talking about. Uh, at the core of that is focusing um, on where the harm has has been most pronounced. And I think you've heard this from other colleagues. And I just want to, you know, we're in a political environment right now. Uh, and just human nature will be to just go back to what we were doing and, and kind of just have the squeaky wheels um, and not really push ourselves to dig deep. And, and I, I, from this whole conversation, I'm very heartened to hear that we all, none of us want that to happen and we're gonna work really hard to make sure it doesn't happen. But that inertia is powerful and it's real. Uh, you know, I've, I've said this stat before, 40% of black businesses in the country are gone, gone. You know, Latino business is not faring much better. Uh, women owned, we have a big report that's uh, just come, getting ready to come out on the impact the pandemic has had on women um, and how it has transformed uh, our economy, the, the livelihood. Uh, so this has not been equal and we need to have a plan of action for those three things I said and many, many others. Uh, and our recovery needs to focus on that. Um, and by doing so, we're going to help the entire community, right? It's not a this is it's not a zero sum game. Uh, by doing that, you're going to we're going to help everybody. And and I just wanted to say that clearly and make sure that we keep our eye on the prize on that because I, I think it's going to be really really important to you know all of all of these these business owners, these folks that need rental assistance. Go down the list. We've talked about a lot of the the areas. Um, and so you, you're welcome to comment on it, but uh, Dr. Stoddard, anyone? But I just I just want to really push on that point because it's going to be it's going to be hard and we're going to, have to do things differently to do that but what i just said is not something that is the the normal course of action but we're going to have to do it so i appreciate it and thank and thank you for all the work you're doing thank you Gaspar. i was just gonna i was just gonna say i i 
Couldn't agree with you more on any of these issues. Um, you know, um, Chief Equity Officer uh, Tiffany Ward has been involved in our recovery executive committee from from the beginning as well. Since so you know, obviously, I want to make sure that was clear. Uh, we we've actually worked with her from the very beginning to make sure we were building in equity. You know, sort of um, uh, how do we put equity into the mission areas as they operate? And she's been very helpful for that. We can always do more. As you know, we also had a. Uh, we had, we had a session of our, uh, both our economic revitalization, uh, uh, economic town halls on women and in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we've actually ha have a, had done a session as well with our recovery, uh, community recovery advisory group, which is a large, uh, um, sort of multi, uh, you know, their community representatives on, on this issue as well. Um, and, and I will tell you everywhere I turn, I see some relation to some of those issues. For example, even in the testimony that uh, for the case with the governor and the unemployment benefits uh, yesterday, there was conversation around childcare. And that may be a big driver of why people haven't gone back to work yet. Right. And so I think that, uh, and that's obviously a huge driver for why women uh, in particular, but also I'm sure uh, other communities haven't been able to go back into the workforce yet because they can't find safe, sustainable childcare. And so obviously I think, you, as you've well said, there, these issues are connected. And so by addressing the issues of our black and brown community and women, we'll, we'll be lifting all boats, as it were. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, thank, thank you, Councilmember Jawando, for bringing up the recovery committee. Um, truth be told, those, those have been happening regularly, and I almost always can't make them because of other conflicts with, um, with committee meetings. I know our, our staff rotate in and out, and I know uh, Ms. Michelson represents us, so I think it, it really benefit everybody. I haven't seen written updates from them in a little while, and I would I think all council members would benefit Ms. Michelson from getting written updates on each of those meetings after after they conclude. This will only become more um, important as as we move through our recovery if we're going to uh, ensure its success. Uh, and to that point, I want to bring everybody's attention to the email we just received from Ms. Wellens on our staff. Um, who's making us aware in this email from 11-11 uh, uh, that um, DHCA needs to correct its website about the expiration of the governor's declared state of emergency as it relates to rent increases under the COVID-19 Renter Relief Act of 2020. Under the Renter Relief Act that you enacted last year, rents may not be raised above the rent guidelines for 90 days after the end of the catastrophic health emergency declared by the governor on March 5th, 2020. Even though media outlets have widely reported that the state of emergency expired on July 1st, which is what DHCA put on its website, in actuality, the declared state of emergency and catastrophic health emergency is actually still in place and will continue until August 12th, 2021. See the attached proclamation dated 7-12-21, in which the governor again renewed the March 5th, 2020 state of emergency. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks, Ms. Wells. So, um, I'm repeating that because I hope, hopefully we have tenants watching and staff who are watching or are uh, working with tenants, uh, uh, nonprofits uh, like our Renters Alliance, and hopefully DHCA is watching and correct and can correct the, uh, the website to let, let our tenants sleep a little easier tonight. And I've noted that I'll make sure that that gets addressed because actually we got a notice from the state making it very clear that the state of emergency has not functionally been eliminated. They need it for some of the extensions of some of the uh, allowances they provide to businesses. They have to keep it in place for those reasons. Right. Very true. Um, and it is very confusing to people. Thank you, Councilmember Navarro and Councilmember Rice for pointing this out. Um, okay. Any other requests to speak from my colleagues? If not, um, thank you all for your presentation. Thank you, Councilmember Novato, for requesting this. I think it was really helpful to everyone. We're going to have to do it again. We're not done with our recovery. Um, and I think we can next move on to item four, our American Rescue Plan uh, ARPA process update. And for that, I'll call on Mr. Howard and Mr. Smith. Gentlemen, welcome. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. President. And Good morning to the council. Um, we'll be brief because I think we're a few minutes behind schedule, um, but uh, the council requested an update on kind of where we're at with the American Rescue Plan Act um, funding and process to see how that's going to be used in fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. Um, so for just as background, the, the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA as we've coined it here in the county um, is a $1.9 trillion 
uh, economic recovery package uh, passed by Congress and then signed into law by President Biden recently earlier this year. It includes multiple funding buckets um, for, for the economic recovery, but one of those buckets is direct aid to state, local, and tribal governments. Uh, the county is expected to re receive almost $204 million um, through this direct aid, um, but it will be received in two tranches, in two equal tranches. One of it was received, the, the first one was received in June of 2021, and we'll receive the second tranche um, around the same time next year in, in June or May of 2022. Um, Treasury has been releasing guidance and reporting requirements uh, throughout the year. Um, some of those links are included in the staff report for this, but staff wants to highlight that. Um, as it, some of it will be different than what the county experienced through the CARES Act, which was also a, a Recovery Act funding that the federal government provided earlier um, in 2020. Um, so the, generally the reporting requirements um, are more extensive and comprehensive for ARPA than they were for the CARES Act. Um, so the funding must be used to support expenditures to target public health um, or negative economic impacts due to the pandemic, except for certain instances, such as pay differential for essential workers, uh, revenue loss for the county um, or the state or tribal governments or necessary investments in water, sewer or broadband. Um, as the county considers how to use ARPA um, for in, in, uh, economic recovery or for public health, it must follow federal procurement guidelines um, when awarding any suburb awards. And if an award is provided non-competitively by the county, we'll need to document appropriate, um, appropriately how we made that decision, how it's linked to that funding. Um, the county will also be responsible for multiple reports uh, with ARPA. The first one's expected here at the end of August, um, based on uses so far to date, um, by July 31st, 2021. We will be issuing quarterly reports on expenditures and performance metrics throughout the, um, the use of ARPA until um, December 2027, um, and how the county is using all of its ARPA funding, including contracts and subawards. And then finally, we will be issuing an annual recovery plan performance report as required by Treasury, which details the county's overall plan to leverage these funds to achieve specific, specific outcomes in an effective, efficient, and equitable manner. Um, and this report must be published annually on a public facing website as well as submitted to the Department of Treasury. Um, and should the county provide any funding to organizations um, and not directly provide those services or programs itself, um, those organizations may be subject to additional reporting um, and audit requirements uh, as noted by the Department of Treasury. So where we stand today, um, the county has already, um, or the council approved based on the recommendation of the executive, um, used about 63% of the $204 million of ARPA funding that we're expected to receive. That $127.69 million was used between fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. So in fiscal 21, based on the Treasury Department's guidance for the revenue loss factor recognition, um, the council approved $91.95 million at the end of fiscal 21 for that rec revenue loss recognition factor. The council also approved $35.74 million in fiscal 22. And as noted in table one on page two, um, the council staff highlights what those uses were for in fiscal 22. Um, so in, in the end, that leaves $76.41 million of the $204 million of ARPA we're expected to receive over the next two fiscal years, or about 37.4% um, for other initiatives in fiscal 22 or fiscal 23. During the budget, council members were able to add lists to what was known then as Category 1, uh, which council staff will just refer to as the ARPA list moving forward um, for potential uses of ARPA in fiscal 22. Um, it also contains some items that council members requested to consider for fiscal 23. So also during the budget, council members requested or noted that they would wish to come back to the ARPA list um, and reconsider additional items post budget um, and also come up with a process and have, have council staff work collaboratively with, with executive staff to develop a process, which is kind of the intent of today's um, conversation discussion, as well as what council staff has presented in the memo. So what council staff has highlighted is and suggests as a framework, at least initially as we go into in fiscal 22 is, is kind of three main items. Um, we're looking for discussion from council members today or in general support for now is that we need to determine or the council should determine how much it wishes to set aside for fiscal 23. As noted in the report, $28.5 million was already identified for uh, potential fiscal 23 ARPA uses. 25 million of that is for the working family income supplement. 
um, 3 million of that is for the <coughs> service hubs and half a million is for the mobile health clinic. Um, council staff and in coordination with OMB and executive staff also believes that the council should consider maybe setting aside another $20 million for unknown needs um, as we go through the rest of fiscal 22 for now. There's no decision before the council today um, and certainly if the council should support uh, setting aside some monies for fiscal 23, um, that decision is not final and it can come back to it throughout the, the fiscal year based on actual needs. Uh, the second part of the framework is to have multiple times to consider all ARPA funding throughout fiscal 22, rather than trying to figure out one month shot through either July or, or early fall. Um, so council staff has developed a framework in order to have multiple opportunities for the council and for the county to consider how to use the, the remaining unallocated ARPA funding in 22 and maybe for 23. Um, one note of item um, as noted in the staff report is, as I noted, the county will receive two tranches of ARPA funding and based on the uses so far, any ARPA funding that the council approves um, for fiscal 22 use will be forward funded from the county's reserves until we do receive those monies in fiscal 20, uh, near the end of fiscal 22, May and June of 2022. And then the last um, suggested framework is that the council use a structured review process to, um, and this contain, contains kind of two, two elements. The first is obviously to make sure that the, the proposed or the expenditure is ARPA eligible based on the not only treasury guidance, but their re reporting uh, requirements, and also to ensure that the expenditure um, conforms with the county's one-time revenues uh, use policy. Um, the second set of items is, is focus elements based on the council's priorities, as we've discussed throughout the, this year um, and throughout the recovery, um, which includes um, ensuring that the funds are used to um, address issues related to the racial equity and social justice of the county, as well as public health efforts. The full list of general elements that would be used in this review process um, are on page four. Um, but once items are considered ARPA eligible, um, this would be the second one. In closing, I think the, the in addition to just in asking for the council to provide um, feedback um, and general support for the elements that we discussed here, the most important one is that as we as the council has calendar um, is only for the next couple of weeks. Uh, anything that wants to be done before the council. Um, is on recess in August and September and early September um, would be for the council to consider ARPA eligible items that are immediate um, needs um, as well as ready to be implemented in July. Um, the next kind of opportunity to come back as we discussed for multiple opportunities would be early fall. Um, this certainly would give more time um, for the council and for county departments to figure out how to refine and, and uh, make sure that any items that are on the ARPA list um, are ready to go in early fall. So finally, the again, uh, the framework includes setting aside monies for fiscal 23, um, including any additional monies besides the $28.5 million that the council already identified, uh, having multiple opportunities to consider ARPA funding, um, and then implementing the structure review process, as you already discussed. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Mr. Howard. Mr. Smith, um, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Council President. Thank you to uh, the staff for detailed report. I really do appreciate mm -hmm. all the work that has gone into this, and I am grateful for the framework uh, that's been set forth. I think it is appropriate. It's a good starting point for us to discuss and think through these issues. I've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, what is the, the the strategy or the thought process behind how we're going to uh, spend these funds, and how do we do that in uh, a way that is, uh, you know, equitable and uh, efficient uh, and also follows our you know fiscal policies and is you know prudent and sustainable uh, you know as we continue putting the federal money uh, to use we need to make sure that we uh, have it uh, because we know the needs are not going away they didn't stop uh, um, you know as uh, things started going to normal and they aren't going to stop as we just had a conversation for the past you know hour and a half, uh, we know that the challenges facing the community you know, aren't getting smaller. The, the gaps have been uh, widened, and uh, we have work to do in order to uh, address them, um, and, and, and we need to continue to do that. So um, as we just heard and, and as uh, the, the staff report uh, notes, we've received $102 million of the ARPA funding. Uh, received that a couple months ago, uh, and we've now appropriated uh, and or spent $127.6 for fiscal year 21 and 22. 
So it means we basically already spent or appropriated 25 million more, or I think 13%, give or take, uh, than we have actually received. So just wondering if staff could share uh, how and from where are we funding the additional 25 million? I understand decisions moving forward will come out of uh, reserves, but you know, we haven't taken action to take money out of uh, general fund reserves up to this point. Uh, so how how are we funding that additional 25 million that we haven't yet received through ARPA? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so the fiscal 22 budget was based on assumptions for resources throughout fiscal 22. Um, and so it includes $127 million um, roughly from ARPA. Um, should the county need the full 127 million in July 2021, um, then obviously anything over the 102 million we receive would be come from reserves and then be backfilled when the county receives the additional or the second tranche in June of 2022. Um, but as is the case with most fiscal years, the expenditures may not occur immediately. Um, they may be occurring throughout the fiscal 22, and so um, if additional resources are available, then it may not come. Um, out of reserves, but in the end, it will come from reserves until we receive the second tranche in June. But just so everybody's clear, because we've had some challenges with this previously, if the council takes no action today on further ARPA funding, if the additional 25 million uh, is uh, needed and ARPA funding has not been received, the executive branch would be required to come to the council with a supplemental appropriation uh, or emergency appropriation using reserves to forward funds those expenditures no that there would, be, would no. They be authorized or would they be authorized to use other resources within the executive budgets uh, up to 10 percent to be able to fund that the council's already approved authority to, to spend that money um, based on the assumption that we'll have 127 million dollars of ARPA funding in fiscal 22 in total um, for that fiscal year. So again, um, the exec executive side would not need any additional authority to spend that money. They may spend it now. So we're not forward funding it out of reserves if the money is needed before then. We would be just spending it, money that we don't necessarily have, and then we would be figuring out the accounting on the back end. That's right. It would that. be an accounting issue in terms of appropriation authority they have all they need um, to, to spend these monies, um, the accounting, again, depending on when the question would be asked, whether it came from reserves or from ARPA would depend on when that question is asked. Yeah, I just think it's important that we clarify that because it's not really spending it out of reserves. It's spending it even though we haven't received it. And then we would you know, have to then go back after the money has been spent, the decisions have been made, and then uh, make uh, decisions accordingly, which I think is an important distinction. Um, yeah, I also think it's important to note that the, the question before us isn't really this question of how much money we should set aside for fiscal year 23. That's really how we've been framing it. But it's really about whether or not we want to continue spending ARPA money we haven't yet received and how much of it, if we do want to proceed with that, what is the appropriate number? Staff has suggested, uh, you know, 20 million uh, is an appropriate number. You know, we may want to go higher, some may want to go lower, but you know, that, that is the question before us. It's not about how much fiscal year 23 uh, set aside we want to have. We don't have this money yet. It's not our uh, money to, 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 to withhold. So the question is whether or not we want to spend money that we haven't yet received and then backfill it with money uh, we expect to receive later. Uh, do we have information on what other jurisdictions are doing? I mean, the, the ARPA funding is, you know, two tranches a year apart uh, is how every other jurisdiction is uh, is, is addressing this. Are, are other jurisdictions using their reserves to forward fund expenses that they expect to receive with money that they haven't yet received? So I think we'd have to look into that a little bit more. We do have some information on how other jurisdictions are, have started or begun to um, use some of their funding, but whether they're using their entire amount right now or just using part of that amount we'd have to uh, look into a little more detail yeah i think that would be really helpful if staff could help to look into what other jurisdictions are using what their policies are not just how they're spending the money but how they're approaching the way in which they're spending the money and uh, most importantly this question of you know forward funding uh, out of reserves it is a unique situation we know exactly how much money we expect to receive we've never really been in that situation, normally state and federal aid is a 
a bit of a crapshoot and we put down a number and we uh, hope it's a little higher uh, than that, but uh, it's, it's not guaranteed. In this case, it's a little bit more certain uh, than otherwise, but um, you know, I do think it would be helpful for us uh, to, to, to understand. Um, you know, appreciate the, the screening elements uh, aspect of the uh, council staff recommendation for the potential uses for the remaining uh, ARPA funds. I do think it's important to make clear uh, that uh, we, we don't have this funding yet. Uh, it's not money that uh, is, uh, is, is in the door. And I know we've talked about the one-time expenses uh, only for uh, 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 one-time uh, funds, which is uh, part of our fiscal plan. But I think it's really important that we uh, include that specifically in the screening elements that uh, this money it really should only be used for one-time expenses that aren't expected uh, to, to continue. And then if they are continued, they have to come from different funding sources or else we'll run into a pretty significant structural budget deficit. So uh, just, just wanted to, uh, to, to, to note that. Um, you know, I'll just close by saying, uh, you know, the federal funding has been crucial to help us meet the needs of residents in an unprecedented crisis. We wouldn't be able to do it without that uh, federal support, but it's also critical that we remember that the funds aren't going to last forever, and we have to be in a position to fund our obligations and sustain our communities and meet these tremendous needs that we spent uh, a lot of time this morning talking about. So uh, look forward to, to that. I'll, I'll also uh, request that we get information on uh, continued information on the FEMA reimbursements, not only when they come in and when they're requested, which has been uh, uh, the tradition up to this point, but since the budget is largely based on FEMA reimbursement revenue, which it's never happened before. We've never done that in the history of the county uh, to understand the policies of how that money is going to be used, whether the money comes in higher or lower than what was expected. You know, how is the council's oversight role going to be fulfilled uh, when it comes to uh, FEMA reimbursements? Because we've made some pretty significant uh, assumptions with uh, money we're not sure uh, when and how it will come in, as has been noted previously. So I just hope that that uh, gets added to the uh, to the docket of things we can uh, discuss and work through. And with that, I'll yield back to you, Council President. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. We have a lot to discuss. Um, these are unprecedented times. Council Member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. And I really want to thank uh, Mr. Howard and Mr. Smith. As usual, pretty pretty awesome product here. I think mm -hmm. it's a good. Um, I think it's a really good way for us to at least begin um, this process and it's a little bit different than how we have to do it in the past. So I really do appreciate this. Um, the one thing I will ask, I know as I mentioned earlier that we did receive from the Office of Legislative Oversight a really, I think important document in terms of how some jurisdictions are doing this work guided through that lens of racial equity and social justice. And again, I'll repeat because who we, you know, we are who we are in the county uh, and because of all the particular areas that I know we all are trying to address, which will directly impact the quality of life in the county, I think that's super important. And so um, I was wondering if there is a plan to take this particular blueprint, if you will, and see how it corresponds with our racial equity and social justice goals. Um, I know that there is a very interesting table uh, in this particular memo um, 10 priorities for advancing racial equity through America Rescue Plan, which I think really truly um, uh, applies to the work that we're trying to do here in Montgomery County. So just wondering whether staff had any opportunity to discuss this with our OLO department and our folks who are assigned to work on racial equity and social justice on the council. And if not, if there is a plan to, again, make sure that this particular blueprint, if you will, how it corresponds or aligns with some of the best practices that are being um, done uh, and adopted uh, nationally, including some examples here of the city of Alexandria. Yes, thank you for that question, Councilman Navarro. And um, certainly, it, it, assuming the council supports uh, moving forward with this process, the the first um, one of the first bullets in our you know, focus criteria that, that we would look at with the different proposed expenditures was alignment with the uh, the council's racial equity and social justice efforts. So we will certainly be working with OLO and the racial justice um, and it, sorry <laughs> the racial equity and social justice uh, teams 
um, in the council and, um, you know, take, looking at some different frameworks. The 1 that, um, that Dr. Bonner Tompkins sent is excellent. And I think it gives us a, a wonderful starting point to say, okay, now that we want, we know we want to do this, let's put this into action and let's look at a framework that we can, um, we can use to do that. And so we will, uh, we will certainly do that going forward before we, um, um, as we kind of review and vet the different proposals. So I just want to then recommend to the body that um, <clears throat> that we give an odd uh, for this particular framework to be utilized. I personally would have preferred uh, a different approach, right? I would have preferred that we had had this information in advance so that the work that you've already done would have been predicated uh, and you know followed uh, some of this this framework versus waiting now to try to. To address it, but, um, but, but we are where we are and you've done extraordinary work. So <clears throat> I just wanted to propose to my colleagues that we and make sure that Dr. Bonner Tompkins, uh, is, is uh, a part of this, you know, discussion as well as Ms. Olson and that these best practices, which are already being adopted nationally, that we then utilize that to guide, um, this, this particular process that is Again, so aligned with what we're saying that what we want to do is address the extraordinary need that we know we have out there and make sure that the county then is poised to have a vibrant economic uh, recovery uh, that is not then undermined by these growing disparities. So I think having a structural way of addressing that is going to be critical. And we obviously have amazing experts in our Office of Legislative Oversight um, that I have been, you know, working on this as well. So, uh, Mr. President, I don't know how you would like to handle it, but I think it would be important to give a nod to Mr. Howard and Mr. Smith and Ms. Mike Michelson to make sure that although um, is constantly, in, you know, consulted and, 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 and included uh, from the very beginning so that everything is aligned as, as we move forward. Right. I, I, I fully agree. I don't know, Mr. Smith and Mr. Howard, whether you have any comment on what the disconnect was here, but there, is there any reason OLO wouldn't be in, engaged from the beginning going forward? No, that's completely fine. We will we will certainly work with it. Great. I seeing heads nodding. I, I think everybody's probably on the same page on that. Um, Thank you. No reason to have this artificial bifurcation. Okay, um, uh, Council Member Riemann. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to focus in on one small point. Um, we do have a continuing challenge reaching the entire community with the vaccinations. And, you know, I've been asking for us to put in funding for some time for incentives, uh, which are proven effective. And um, it seems like we're going through a fair amount of process as we should for allocating what is really a large amount of money, but, you know, isn't there urgency here to move forward with this concept. Um, so I'd just like to ask my colleagues for some thought or guidance here, you know, on an accelerated time frame. if there is some other mechanism to expend funding for that goal, you know, we could pursue that, but uh, I'm just not aware of what that would be. Um, you know, so uh, it may, I added it to the list. Others may have as well. I don't know. But um, I'm a little unclear from this doc, like our discussion today. What do you think is the timeline? Let's say we all agreed to, you know, devote some share of funding towards vaccine incentives. What would be the timeline that that could be approved under? Um, it, we can ask council staff, like what, or and maybe council president is where, like what is the timeline here that we're looking at generally for those items that we do think you know, ought to go forward earlier rather than later. So for um, for items that are either time critical and, and needed for implementation in the, um, you know, in the, the time frame when the council would be on recess, then we would be looking at potentially, um, you know, finding all those, making sure the different ideas are, are vetted and, and eligible um, for ARPA funding. And then we could present something for the council's consideration to um, introduce next Tuesday and then approve prior to um, on the July 27th work session. Um, okay. there'll, there'll probably be a smaller number of things just because of the complication of the um, the review and compliance process 
um, making sure everything's eligible. We want to make sure everything will stand up to audit if that, you know, um, if an auditor comes in in, in the future. Um, but there will be a small number of, of limited things that we are um, currently working on and reviewing. Okay, that's super helpful. I wasn't totally clear on that. Thank you so much. Well, certainly uh, would encourage us to include that as a front end, you know, expenditure. Um, and uh, I'll follow up with folks about, about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rice. Councilmember Rice, why don't we move on to Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I appreciate everyone, uh, all of their hard, uh, the hard work of Mr. Smith and Mr. Howard. Um, I believe your next steps are logical. Um, I do believe that we need to have flexibility, but we need to be revisiting this as well. And I think that in your next steps, that's certainly a built in. I believe council, uh, I know that council member Navarro has already touched on that, that we need to keep OLO informed and, and involved in this process. You know, we said all along that we were we were flying the plane as we were building it. We've gotten better at the plane we've built, but we still are not. We still are, are behind, it seems, at, at, because we have so much need and people who have come to us for their needs had never come to us before in some cases for all of the problems that we've seen. And so it's very difficult to catch up. And I appreciate that. And hopefully, because of uh, a framework, we will be able to at least have a flexible blueprint. So I'm, I'm supportive of, of the uh, of staff suggestions. I, I do believe that that um, that at the end of the day, we need to make certain that the public is being taken care of. And I think we're doing that. And we've all said time and time again, thank goodness for the federal government's involvement in this. Because if we didn't have their money, we'd have been in real trouble. So, bottom line is, I am supportive of staff suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rice. Are you back with us? Any other requests to speak? If not, uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Glass. Thank you. Yep, you're next. Sorry. Uh, I see Councilmember Wright. Oh, he's gone again. Okay, so uh, so I'll just talk real quick. Uh, so. I I appreciate and share the the comments of, of my colleagues, particularly the thoughts that that Councilmember Katz just shared, um, and and picking up at the very end of what he was saying that we in this fiscal budget we have to thank our federal delegation for helping provide these funds to close the gaps. Um, that is absolutely true, and as has been noted previously there were structural gaps that existed before these funds became available. And we just need to proceed cautiously with eyes wide open, recognizing the gaps that have existed and that this funding is only temporary. And while it is absolutely true that there is incredible need uh, and innovative ideas that we can deploy with these funds and uh, President Biden continues sharing other ideas, uh, encouraging municipalities and local localities uh, to be creative within the letter of the law for these funds, but they don't last forever. And we know it is hard to draw down on programs once we start them. And so I, I think collectively we, we understand that and we just have to uh, put our notions and words into action and proceed, I think, cautiously on behalf of this gift from the federal government to make sure that everybody continues to be healthy, safe, and economically secure, which is essentially what these programs, uh, this funding program uh, was designed to do. So I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. Sorry about that. I'm having problems muting. I apologize, guys. Um, look, so uh, what I what what I basically wanted to say is this: when we look at uh, ARPA funding, and again, I'm just coming fresh off of a NACO conference, so of course, counties across America are talking about this right now and the best strategies. Uh, 
Mr. Smith, when it comes to lost revenue uh, and the lost revenue calculator, uh, something that they highlighted that counties should be uh, utilizing and making sure that that's a part of the, is that a part of that total funding that we have right now that we've identified? Uh, correct. The um, council, um, based on the executive's recommendation, used almost $92 million in fiscal 21 based on that revenue loss rec or factor recognition as provided in Treasury's guidance. So now, okay, okay great. So would it be possible to then use that to backfill the revenues, which then would end up freeing up uh, the unallocated reserves? And that would give us the ability to utilize these the, the, uh, the funds for basically whatever we wanted to at that point. There would be no restrictions, kind of like what you know we, we had heard highlighted before, um, some of the restrictions like Council Member Friedson had said uh, regarding limitations for one-time use, those kinds of things. I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, more flexibility by doing something like that. That's a strategy being employed by other uh, counties across the country. So I'm curious as to whether or not we're looking at doing that as well. I would certainly would agree that it creates more flexibility. Um, the council would need to approve additional um, appropriation through that manner. The 92 million was built into the 20 fiscal 22 expectations in terms of reserves. And so that those monies have already been allocated, so to speak, in terms of uh, balancing the fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 budget. But um, certainly that could be a, a uh, effective manner if the council wishes to proceed with that and additional um, uses of ARPA to, to use the recognition or the revenue factor uh, recognition. Or so, Mr. Loss. President, what I would ask is, is that we consider uh, that, that sort of strategy. Again, something that I just learned about at NACO uh, as a part of our ARPA briefings. We had the Treasury Department that was there that was talking very uh, candidly about these kinds of things and trying to recommend best practices for counties across the nation to be able to really maximize uh, the ability for us to do a lot of investment. Uh, understanding that there's still some guardrails that are set there that really make it difficult for us. And just last but not least, I uh, certainly want to put in a plug for Working Family Income Supplement. I do think we need to make sure that we have some of that money allocated for FY23. I think that would make sense for us uh, to certainly uh, have that as a set aside as well. But uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Agreed. And yeah, if you could uh, keep us uh, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Howard plugged into the Treasury Department guidance, that would be in best practices. That would be terrific. We're all learning this in real time. Um, I don't see any other requests to speak, I think. So, um, Mr. Smith, Mr. Howard, this is terrific, really helpful to us. We're uh, making the road by walking here and we really rely on your guidance. So this is really uh, very, very helpful and we look forward to the next update. Thank you both. Um, colleagues, now I think we can take on the uh, consent calendar, take up the consent calendar. Uh, is there a motion to approve it? So moved. Second. Uh, Council Member Reamer moves. Council Member Katz seconds. Um, I think there's going to be a couple requests to speak on an item. Let me let me just say um, briefly, I, I think a number of council members are going to want to speak, so uh, we could take them all off the consent calendar or we could just not be sticklers today. Um, I'll be brief. Um, on item A, that um, regards our minority female and disabled owned business program, which was created as a remedy against the effects of long-standing discrimination against local businesses that happen to be owned by a woman, a person of color, or a resident with a disability in the awarding of our county contracts. The item is a special appropriation to fund a disparity study. The county executive was supposed to complete one in 2019 and again by 20, July 1st of this year to evaluate the need to extend the program, but that has not been completed. So this, this supplemental appropriation funds the office of the county attorney to procure a consultant to complete the study. We spend nearly a billion dollars a year in our procurements and our taxpayers all benefit from supplier diversity and greater competition. Um, there are hundreds of local businesses that benefit from this program. They're the backbone of our economy. And in my view, they're exactly who we should be uh, uh, helping and focusing on to ensure a robust recovery. This has been a critical program for the county for years and never more so than following our formal commitment um, thanks to Councilmember Navarro's leadership, to racial equity and social justice. We can't be serious about addressing generational, um, generational in wealth inequality without protecting and defending this program, which uh, will be under attack again. So I'm grateful to all of you uh, colleagues to, for supporting the special appropriation and the expedited bill 2921. It sends a powerful message, I believe, uh, to have it all sponsored by the, the full council. Um, 
Having said that, Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. Thank you to you and, and Council Member Navarro in particular for, for item A. I think it's a critical uh, issue. I won't harp on everything that you have just said, but uh, just ditto to that. Uh, th this is long overdue, and I'm very pleased to, to support that. I wanted to just quickly note uh, item B, the uh, resolution to approve completing the Capital Trails Network. I uh, really uh, appreciate uh, the uh, co-sponsorship of Council President Hucker, Council Vice President Alvernaz, uh, Council Member Navarro, Katz, Reamer, Glass, and Rice. Uh, looks like we have uh, pretty good support here. Um, it's uh, the Capital Trails Coalition really de deserves most of the credit, uh, uh, nearly all the credit, uh, for their work and advocacy on completing a trail network that will allow people to walk and bike safely to more places throughout the region. And we talk a lot about trails, and we just did uh, Parks and Recreation Month and talked about the, the wellness aspect of our trail network uh, as a recreational asset, but we don't often talk about it uh, as the uh, critical transportation infrastructure uh, that it plays uh, in our community, uh, just like roads do. It's obviously important for, uh, for health and recreation, but it's also a critical part of uh, our uh, transportation uh, network to allow people to get around to, to work and to activities in a much more environmentally sustainable way. This council has consistently supported our trail network as part of the broader regional uh, trail network. So this resolution is consistent with where we've been and, and where we continue uh, to work towards uh, going. Uh, in fact, the two specific Montgomery County projects in the top 40 priorities part of this resolution, the new Capitol Crescent Trail along the Purple Line and the portion of the Metropolitan Branch Trail in Silver Spring are already underway and funded in our capital budget uh, thanks to broad commitment of the county's political leadership. That said, we have a lot more to do, ensuring the Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel under Wisconsin Avenue gets built, the Pepco Power Line Trail, which we just received tremendous state support uh, to get underway, which is really exciting. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, work to do here. And it's also important in this moment as we continue to see uh, and talk about a massive federal infrastructure investment that we hope to see uh, that we continue to make sure that trails are viewed and treated as the critical transportation infrastructure that they are uh, and that they be eligible uh, for those funds and that we continue to pursue it. So uh, thank you to colleagues for your support. Thank you to all of the advocates and uh, volunteers and, and trail users uh, and look forward to uh, having this uh, formally pass the council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council Member Nevada. Thank you, Mr. President. This is definitely a very important consent calendar. Um, don't want to speak too long because that is not supposed to be the practice, but do want to point out item E, Office of Legislative Oversight Memorandum Report. It's an update on the Children's Trust and County Designated Nonprofit Entities. Very important report as we all are trying to um, really have the best information uh, to consider what is the next step on the uh, Early Care and Education Initiative. As you all know, it's been a real dream of mine, and one day we get to dedicated funding stream, and governance is definitely part of that. Um, although we don't have a dedicated funding stream, we do have a significant investment uh, already in place and quite a bit of uh, really positive results, and there are a lot of conversations right now taking place about possible governance and possible private-public partnerships, and I think this particular report um, the update in this report will be really uh, important information for uh, council members, staff to um, best discern what would be the most appropriate fit for a jurisdiction like Montgomery County. So I want to thank the Office of Legislative Oversight for this update, and I look forward to the um, ongoing conversation and possibly some uh, action on, on this topic. Thank you. I think our council president may have frozen. Unless he's really in-depthly reading something. Yeah. I think it's a deep freeze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A deep freeze, right. I think he froze. Well, we'll 
we'll just give him a moment because uh, he has the queue and I don't want to presume who is speaking next. And so let's just give him a minute or two. How about those nets? Well, that was a minute or two. Um, I, I uh, had, had requested to speak as well, so I'm gonna make an executive decision here and just go ahead and uh, uh, speak now um, and wait till our council president comes on so we can formally take this vote. But I wanted to highlight item C uh, for my colleagues, which is the Medicare for All resolution. I wanna thank my colleagues uh, who have co-sponsored this, what I feel is a very important resolution to affirm formally that Montgomery County believes strongly that healthcare is a right, uh, particularly high quality healthcare. And I want to especially thank Progressive Maryland, as well as the Maryland Progressive Healthcare Coalition and a number of organizations that have made up that coalition, including CASA, ATU Local 689, the Maryland Poor People's Campaign uh, for the Montgomery County Region and the Rockville Human Services Advisory Commission. This issue on the national level, as we know, has become a political football, uh, as so many have. Uh, but what we also know is that there are over 32 million residents of this country under the age of 65 that do not have any form of health insurance. And here in Montgomery County, there are approximately 74,000 county residents who do not have health insurance. While we have done everything we can within reason to provide support for all of our residents, there is no question uh, that there is an important role for our federal government to play uh, to ensure uh, the health and wellness of all of our residents across this country. And we also know that this is not just a moral responsibility to do this, but we know this has significant uh, economic implications, public health implications. And of course, as we've seen this last year and a half, those public health imp implications are profound. And so while uh, this makes its way through Congress, uh, Montgomery County stands with jurisdictions across this country uh, in urging our federal government to provide the support necessary for all of our residents to receive the health care that they and so many desperately need. So uh, I would normally yield back to our council president, uh, but he has not come back. So uh, did was there, oh, here he comes now. Well, that was fun. Um, anyway, sorry for uh, uh, the delay, colleagues. Did you take a vote on the consent calendar? We have not, Mr. President. I just took uh, the liberty to go ahead and speak on uh, regarding the item that I wanted to uplift, which was I'm, item C, the Medicare for All resolution. And I yield back to you to see if anyone else is in the queue. I, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue. Any other you can wave at me. Okay. If not, uh, all those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hand. Councilman Marine will do something about this infrastructure problem we have. Uh, that is unanimous. Uh, okay. Now we can recess until 1.30. Thank you all.